in what I say and what I do so that I can get the end result that we're looking for. Did something, like a lot of people have problems in their marriages. Yours yeah. wasn't perfect either. Not no, at all. Nobody who I've ever spoken to has had a, had a perfect one. So did this intention come from, uh-oh, our relationship isn't working and unless we do something... Yes, yeah, so our, our intentionality came from if you're married more than five years, you're not married to the same person you married. Mm -hmm. Like, and we got a, a revelation that you keep changing every five years, and I needed to relearn who she was. What she used to like, she didn't like anymore. Yeah. And so I would do certain things, and I was like, man, that used to really work. <laughs> like, that used to really get you going. Like, what, what happened? And so we made an intentionality that I am not going to pause your growth on the frame that I remember you as. Yeah. I'm going to keep learning you. And out of that, you know, I think it was, we had two kids and our, our son, um, we found out he had autism. And when we talk about crazy faith, like I'm sitting here and I'm believing for a change in his diagnosis mm -hmm. and we're going to therapies and all this other stuff. And in the midst of all that, I realized that that situation changed me and my wife a bunch. Hmm. And we had to go into a level of intentionality and in making space for the new version of who we were hmm. to each other and fall in love with that person. And as we begin to do that, we like that person better than the one we married. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like we begin to understand like, man, I love you even more now because we've been through this together and because you're still here and because we can still laugh about that. And again, making space mm -hmm. made us love each other even more. And I don't know, I, I'm right after we get off this podcast, I'm gonna go find her. I'm missing <laughs> her right now. I, I need to give her a hug and a kiss right now. By the way, I think that what you said was so profound. The person who you're with now is a totally different person than you were with five years ago, although they still sleep on the same side of the bed. Yep. They still use the red toothbrush. They still do yep. what they've always done. They are different. And you're right. It is relearning. I've actually, it's funny. I've been having these conversations with Joel lately about this is who I am today. Yep. I used to enjoy doing that stuff, and now I'm this person. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back! Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go! We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back! The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. Yes, yes, yes. Shop today with Joe Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day Kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts.
Have you ever felt something from God and you thought to yourself, like, is this my gut or my soul talking or is it God? Because I was wondering how do we, and I've wanted this just for myself, how do you figure out if it's your yeah. will or him? I have this chapter in the book called Maybe Faith. Okay. And I think it's my my favorite part of the book because people is like, how do you know it's God? How do you know it's the right thing? And most pastors won't tell you this, but I'll tell you very straight. You don't like you don't you don't know at the starting line. Is this God? It proves to be God. Uh -huh. And this is why I, I tell people I live my life at 51 percent faith. If 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 I'm 51 percent mm -hmm. sure it's God, I'm going for it. <laughs> okay. And because I have the heart to be able to be corrected and I'm humble ah, enough good. to say, you know what? I missed that. That I thought that was it. But I <laughs> hey, my bad guys really going on. And that's where I, I've been able to see so many amazing things happen because some people stand at the starting line is like, OK, how long is this going to take? How much is this going to cost? Are we going to win? Is this worth it? And they end up living their life paralyzed at a pause at the start. And what I do is it's very I tell people this. I said it's it's a lot easier to direct the moving car than it is to, to direct or, or steer a car that's standing still. <laughs> that's and true. I really do believe that as you start making the step, like, I'm not sure that this is it, but I'm going to at least start looking up homes in this city. Yeah. As you make that step, then there's either confirmation or denials or checks or your peace is not there. And then you'll know, like, well, maybe I need to go back to prayer. And maybe I need to do something else. And as you live on maybe faith, like maybe this is you. Yeah, yeah. I see so many good things happen and um, it just takes being humble. Well, I do like that you talk about change because I think a lot of people say, whether they're in a relationship um, or friendships or whatever, like people are who they are. You either accept them or you don't. People don't change. They can change around the edges, mm -hmm. but in reality, that's who the, that's how they were raised that's the way they're going to be what's what's your answer yeah, i don't that? really believe that because i know who i am mm -hmm. and i know who i was mm -hmm. and i know who i'm i'm trying to be hmm. i was a liar i was a manipulator i was somebody who was addicted to to pornography and hmm. wrong images and i i had a lot of evil in my heart i i i I only looked out for myself. I was very selfish. Like that's who I was. Mm -hmm. it, it's was it wasn't what I presented, but that's who I was on the inside. Mm -hmm. And now today, I look at my life and how I give everything that uh, I have to help people, to serve other people, to make exceptions and uh, uh, allowances for people's faults and shortcomings. How I like that was not. Me like mm -hmm. I, I, like that was not me. I I had a uh, a potential uh, what was it called? Uh, I had a case um, in court for car insurance fraud mm -hmm. and like all like I was a crazy guy. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I'm sitting here today, and I am I am all about spreading a message of hope, uh -huh. love, faith, and really helping people become their best versions. I know that transformation is real. I know that change is possible, and I am acutely aware of the grace that we all need to yeah. be able to make those decisions. Did, did your change, did your moment, did it come like a lightning bolt? Did your moment <laughs> of change come in baby steps and take years? Like Yeah. My, one of my greatest sayings, and if you come around our church, our organization, you'll hear this all the time, progression, not perfection. Hmm. I think that this, if this could become people's mantra, they would be able to do so much more when they allow the little movement forward to be the win instead of this big, like you said, lightning bolt mm -hmm. moment. It wasn't that for me. It was like this year, I'm going to become better at listening and keeping my word. Hmm. And next year, I'm going to try to stop eating a, a gallon of ice cream every <laughs> night before I go to bed. And this year, I'm going to open my scriptures, and I want to read at least 10 minutes a day. It, like, it just has been like baby progression, steps. baby steps, baby faith, just making moves. And I look up 10, 15 years later, and it's like, you're a pastor of a church, and you're talking to <laughs> hundreds of thousands of people weekly. And like, I'm like, who are you? Like, that's how I feel. 
Do you ever drift away from God? Ooh. Do you ever? And, <laughs> You talking big language right here, right now. You used one of my trigger words, oh. drift. Oh. This year, our word for our church is anchored. Hmm. And we, we are trying to get anchored spiritually, emotionally, physically, like and, and it's in every area of our life. Mm -hmm. But the tagline is this is the year of the anti-drift. Oh. And the one thing about drifting, so you said drifting and it like went through my whole body right there. <laughs> Because um, drifting is natural if there's not intention. Say that again. That was good. Drifting is natural if there is no intention. Yes. yes. If you put a boat in water, there does not have to be a storm for that boat to drift. If you just put it there with no anchor, it's going to be out to sea in an hour and a half mm -hmm. because there was no intention of dropping an anchor somewhere. Mm -hmm. And yes, to answer your questions, there are tons of places in my life that I have drifted because I was not intentional. Mm -hmm. So one of those areas was in my health. Very practically, the church is blowing up. I'm having all of these kids. And as the church <laughs> is blowing up, I'm blowing up. Like I'm <laughs> eating everything. I'm fat and happy. I'm, I'm eating ice cream. I'm doing all the different things. And this year, when we talk about anchored, I looked at myself and I was 264 pounds. I was completely out of shape, all of those different things. And in a quiet time, I really felt so strongly that this was an area that I had been drifting. Yeah. And I made a decision that if, if I was shown something, I was gonna start in crazy faith, making steps toward that. So we started eating better, got a trainer, like I literally just finished working out. I'm, a I'm 229 pounds today. Whoa. From That was four months ago. And, and I'm 229 pounds, almost lost 35 pounds since I made the decision. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, yes, yes. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. This is fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go! International Day of the Girl. The strength and courage of these women is remarkable. What's your message to girls who want to make a difference? Believe in yourself. You can make it happen. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Just one last question, because I want to hear a sermon right now. I feel like I wish I could hear one. But <laughs> but is there is there and I'm not going to I don't want to pin you down right now in case you can't. Sometimes you can't remember you've done so many great sermons. But was there one that really 
resonated with people in a way that surprised you? I mean, I know I could, I'm, I mean, I'm feeling like we're having one right now and we're just having a podcast, but, but was there, was there one that sort of sticks out in your mind that if, that you could share with us for a little bit? Yeah, I, I think it would be the first message that I ever did of crazy faith. Um, I, I, I came off sabbatical, mm -hmm. like literally this was my first message after being off for six weeks. And when I got up and spoke, I told people, I brought two chairs out on the stage and one was a kitty chair mm -hmm. and one was like an adult chair. And I was telling them, I said, most of us don't have faith in situations, circumstances and places if it doesn't look strong enough to hold us up. Hmm. And I brought this big guy out on stage <laughs> and I said, which chair would you want to sit in? And he, of course, said the big chair. Yeah. And I said, what if I told you that the small chair was manufactured to hold you up? What if I told you this was God's will for your life? What if I told you that it can carry your weight? Which chair would you choose? And he said, I'd still choose the big <laughs> chair. And I said, doesn't this sound like many of our lives that we would rather choose the thing that looks good? than the thing that was built for us. Hmm. The thing that, that really other people mm -hmm. would say is not really the best for us, but the manufacturer or God tells you, like, I know this doesn't look like what you thought, but I want you to sit in it. I said, what if I sat in the chair? Then would you sit in it? And he was like, maybe. And so I sat in the <laughs> kitty chair and we were about the same size. And I said, now would you sit in that chair? He said, I don't know. And I said, sit in the chair. I said, look how much time you've wasted being able to stand on your own when something was designed for you yeah. that looked different, yeah. but really was designed yeah. to hold up your weight. And then when that man sat down in the chair yeah. and it held him up like he was being cautious, <laughs> the whole uh, auditorium <laughs> began to shout and you know what I'm saying? The, and because it was a picture yes. of what so many of us are living we're living this idealistic life like if God would give me this and my chair looked like that yeah. and I had this husband yes. and I had this job yeah. and I was able to work at this city and all this other stuff and God said no this no. chair is different it looks different yeah. it's not probably what you would have put but I designed it specifically for you just for you would you have crazy faith and put your weight on it see the whole thing was he didn't care if somebody else put their weight on it but yeah. faith is actually putting your own weight and believing and trusting that this thing will hold you up. And I don't know, somebody may be listening right now that has an idea of what you want your chair or your life to mm -hmm. look like, and God may have a different chair for you yeah. that you're going to have to step in crazy faith and put your weight on it. But when you put your weight on it, how much more exciting <laughs> is it to be in something that was manufactured for you, your life, your family, and I didn't know it was going to resonate with so many people, wow. but we put that up online and millions of people have watched that message and um, just started living a life of crazy faith after that. Well, you are such a unique pastor. You're all by yourself. I mean, you help people with relationships. You talk about people, things that, that you don't expect a pastor to talk about. And I love that because you got it's, to. it's all part of us. This book, Crazy Faith, is beautiful, and I love the subtitle, It's Only Crazy Until It Happens. Michael Todd, man, what a blast. Thank you. Oh, we could do this once a week. Come Maybe on. we need to start the Mike and Hoda show. Hey. We can, we can, hey, listen, let's, let, let's, hey. let's do an hour uh, every week or every two weeks. Uh, let's look, do it. I'll be your sidekick any day <laughs> of the week. <laughs> Thank you, honey. I appreciate you. Oh, I love Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, at the time, I was living in Paris. I was just a couple months out of college, and I was working as a paralegal and pursuing this other, you know, stringer position on the side. And I hadn't been feeling well for a while. It started with an itch, and the itch blossomed into all kinds of mysterious symptoms. Mm -hmm. I was getting colds all the time and coming down with bouts of bronchitis. Uh, but the biggest symptom I had was fatigue. Mm. But of course, at 22, everyone is tired. Yeah. Everyone that I was hanging out with was working hard and 
going out at night dancing. And so I didn't really make much of it. And I went to see a number of doctors, all of whom, you know, treated that specific symptom or ailment and sent me home. And toward the end of my time in Paris, I started to get the feeling that my doctors that I was seeing weren't taking me seriously. Mm -hmm. But I think the truth is I wasn't entirely taking myself seriously. Mm -hmm. And it was only when I got to a point where I was so weak, it was a struggle to walk up and down the stairs, that I found myself in an emergency room. And within 24 hours, I was on a plane back home to upstate New York, and I got the bone marrow biopsy that led to my actual diagnosis. To hear the words that you were diagnosed with a specific type of leukemia at 22 is scary enough, but when they said the chances of survival were one in three, I mean, my God, like what does a, what goes through a 22 year old's head? I think there was this immediate sense of fracture. There was my life before and everything that came after. And, you know, I never returned to Paris, to my apartment, to my job. Friends packed up my things and and Mm. sent them to my house. And I had this sense, even though I couldn't quite wrap my head around what it meant to have a cancer diagnosis at 22, that the person I'd been before was buried. There was Mm. no returning Mm. to that pre-diagnosis self. The cancer fight, and I don't know how you describe it, but it usually there's a beginning and an end point for it. I mean, I had breast cancer, I think for six or eight months, I went through stuff. Yeah. Your timing, the, the three and a half, was it three and a half, four years of going through chemo and bone marrow and chemo again. How did you see light and how Mm -hmm. did you survive all those days? One of the most challenging parts of that experience was the sense of the goalposts moving. Mm -hmm. I didn't know, you know, on day one that I was going to be in treatment for three and a half years. And they say you can survive anything as long as you can see the end date in sight. And there came a point in my treatment where I couldn't see that end in sight. Mm. And That was the most challenging, I think, to know how to kind of anchor yourself when you're swimming in a sea of uncertainty. I mean, there are life lessons that come in your worst times. I mean, some change we we choose in our life and some is cast upon us and Mm -hmm. you have to figure it out. And I don't know, I remember so clearly how the world got clear. Like it, I was never clear. I think I was kind of always mushy about things. Mm. Those are my friends. I don't love that one so much, but so what? They're nice. I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. And then all of a sudden you realize like my life has a beginning and an end and I'm not wasting time. Like that time is over. Yeah. Did you have that sensation? Yeah, I think like, you know, a lot of people in their early 20s, I had this feeling of time. Yes. I had time to figure out who I was, time to figure out what I wanted to do. And that diagnosis brought into immediate, urgent focus, the fact that we're all here for a finite Mm -hmm. period of time. And I felt a strange sense of urgency around time. Mm -hmm. And I had the same experience. It felt like all the artifice just kind of fell away. Yeah, I got clear not only about who my friends were, but maybe more importantly, who I wanted to be friends with and what Mm -hmm. kind of relationships I wanted to cultivate. And I had such limited energy that I was well enough to maybe do three things every day, small Mm. things like write an email, watch a movie, see a friend. And what that meant for me was that I had to get very clear about my priorities. Wow, that is so true. And there's something so strange about how free you feel suddenly. You didn't even realize you were carrying all that heavy junk around. It's like, I didn't even, you know, you don't even realize it. It's like my shoulders feel lighter, even though you're in the middle of it. So to have, a doctor say to you after a bone marrow transplant and chemo again, okay, I don't know if he used the term cancer free or mm-hmm. you are in remission, but to hear those words, what did what did that moment feel like? Mm. I mean, I had been hoping to hear those words for almost three and a half years. The goal had always been 
to survive. And I'd spent, you know, 1400 days working tirelessly oh, toward that goal. And I thought when I got to that place, I would want to celebrate. Yeah. I wanted to feel grateful. I wanted to quickly and organically fold back into the rhythms of living. But instead, I found myself in this kind of limbo, this kind of in-between place where on paper, I was better. Mm -hmm. But off paper, I couldn't have felt further from being the healthy, happy, you know, 27 year old that I'd hoped to be on the other side of all this. Well, especially because when you spend almost well, three and a half years in one space, the I, it's the same thing, the idea that, OK, now this is over and all your friends or some of your friends and colleagues are saying, oh, great. So now we can go back to the way it was. Let's go out to the bar. Let's go have some fun. Exactly. You weren't feeling those things. Yeah, I wanted to be you wanted to. Yeah. Things. But, you know, I think often when we talk about things like cancer, the kind of final act yeah. or the end of the story is comes with a cure. Uh, but we mm -hmm. don't talk a lot about what happens after. Mm -hmm. And it took me a, a while to even acknowledge to myself how much I was struggling. There were so many unanswered questions that I didn't know what to do with. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, how do I find a job when I need to nap for four hours mm -hmm. in the day or my immune system is still sending me to the emergency room on mm -hmm. a regular basis? How do I date when I have a quarter inch of hair and a port still in my chest? How do I talk about, you know, the side effects of chemo like infertility or early menopause? Like all of it felt so overwhelming. And in a weird way, I found myself almost wishing that I was still sick, not because I wanted to have leukemia, of course, but I understood the hospital ecosystem. Right. That was the world right. I lived in for four years. I felt comfortable there. I looked like the other patients. It was the outside world mm -hmm. that felt scary and foreign and daunting to me. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. Didn't fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back. People really don't know what's going to happen. Really a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, I know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. By the man of the Richards. All right, it just did too. for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. Didn't fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's, Let's go. go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. <laughs> What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back! So I love your New York Times column. I thought it was so beautiful and riveting and moving. But what I loved so much more was when people reached out to you because they wanted because they, they connected with you. You had mm. this way that 
whether you were sick before or you weren't or you knew, somehow people felt you like that you, you reached across and you grabbed them by the heart mm. and people wrote you letters and you know in in this industry sometimes you get a letter and you got beautiful letters and you read them but then you did something totally amazing like i have not <laughs> i have not heard of someone doing this but what did you do with those letters that you got so you know in that year after i finished treatment i was in the most lost place yeah. I've ever been. I knew I wasn't a cancer patient anymore. I knew I couldn't return to the person I'd been pre-diagnosis, but I had no idea who I was. And so I started thinking about these different rites of passages that we have in our culture, these kind of ritualized ceremonies that help us move through transitions mm -hmm. like baby showers and mm -hmm. weddings and funerals. And I realized that there wasn't a kind of ritual or rite of passage when you emerge from a long illness. Mm -hmm. And I needed that. I needed time to reckon with what I'd been through and to reflect on yeah. who I wanted to become. I needed the space away from my home and my kind of cancer identity to really kind of come into my own. And so I hatched this kind of boondoggle <laughs> of a plan and I decided to learn how to drive. You hadn't. You didn't have your license. I did not have my license. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I rented out my apartment yeah. and I borrowed a friend's car and I ended up embarking on a fifteen thousand mile road trip across the country to meet some of the strangers who'd written me letters about their own major life interruptions mm. and their own stories of transition and. They really, you know, those individuals, there were about 22 of them that I visited, became my sort of breadcrumb trail through the wilderness of survivorship. Mm. I was always prepared for the other shoe to drop, uh. prepared for something to go wrong. And what I found instead in these encounters and on that road trip was that the world really welcomed me at mm. every turn. I ended up, you know, staying on someone's fold out couch. I stayed on a ranch in Wyoming with a family of survivalist ranchers. I visited a high school teacher in California who was grieving the death of her son. I went oh. to uh, a maximum security prison in Texas to visit a death row convict. And each of those conversations helped me gain a sense of perspective mm. on my own predicament. But more than that, I think it showed me a way to reimagine community and it gave me this sense of connection that at a time in my life when I felt so lost and so isolated really helped me see a path forward. Are you happy? I'm so happy. <laughs> what, what makes you happy now? The strange thing in the last year of this pandemic is I found myself uh, living a, a version of the life that I had when I was sick, which mm. is to say that my circle is much smaller, smaller right. my life is quieter. And I don't know about you, but I have spent so much of the last decade striving and working and hustling. And I feel so privileged to get to do work that I love. Mm -hmm. But I've also been thinking about the way that, that working at that pace can be its own kind mm -hmm. of trauma response. Mm -hmm. So this year for me, my goal has been leisure. Uh, which isn't to say I'm not working all the of time, you are. yeah. But you know these small moments that I've gotten to have in the last year of of being at home with our dogs, of gardening, of hanging out with my partner John. Of you know, it's so interesting because I I sometimes think like life is full of exclamation points. It's like the good ones. You graduated from college, you meet a great guy, you have a baby, you get married. And then on the flip side, it's you get a sad diagnosis, somebody passes away, et cetera. But most of the days mm -hmm. are just Wednesday yeah. in the middle. Nothing terrific and nothing horrible, just Wednesday. Yeah. Something I've been thinking about recently is trying to approach my Wednesday as ritual, hmm. washing the dishes as ritual, mm -hmm. gardening as ritual, and really trying to kind of slow down and, and savor that because it's so easy to move from one exclamation point to the next. But I'm sure as you know, you know, when you get a scary diagnosis, you're not thinking about the things that are on your resume. Mm -hmm. You're thinking about the people you love mm -hmm. and wanting to spend time with them. 
you're thinking about the things that nourish you Mm -hmm. and yeah all the rest doesn't matter as much and it falls away you know we live in a country that has this culture uh, or this anxiety of around accomplishment Um, and in this season in my life I'm trying very hard um, to resist that and, and to kind of center myself back and those things that I love, the same things that I loved as a little girl, the dancing and music and, and writing and, and family. Speaking of music, music has always been a big part of your life. Music has always been a big part of my life. Which explains your very handsome and awesome boyfriend. <laughs> if you don't know John Baptiste, and we're going to bring him in here in just a second, but he's a cool cat, boy. Is he something special? He is. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. High forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. Didn't fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. International Day of the Girl. The strength and courage of these women is remarkable. What's your message to girls who want to make a difference? Believe in yourself. You can make it happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All right, it's this big. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back! To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. Oh, no. More good people than bad people, you know, right? Yeah, five seconds. There is some late breaking news for hours in the Iowa caucuses. All right, it just made it. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. I'm sitting smack dab in the middle of a love story. <laughs> um, okay, so. You're 13 years old. You're both geeks. I know you are at 13 because nobody was not a geek at 13. Oh, yes. So are you guys close to the same age? Yeah, we're about a year and a half apart. A year and a half apart. Mm-hmm. So, uh, John, do you remember uh, your girl from band camp at age 13? <laughs> so here's what I remember. Uh-huh. I remember Birkenstocks. This is not an You had Birkenstocks on? Before they were cool. Yeah. <laughs> she was ahead. Suleika was ahead. <laughs> now, and I also must say... I am am honored to talk to you because when I was growing up at that time, I was watching you on WWL. Come on, oh. come on. <laughs> so when I was growing up in New Orleans, Kenner, Louisiana, uh-huh. you'd be on TV. My first time leaving was to go to this band camp. First time leaving <laughs> home and being somewhere for the summer. You go somewhere for the summer for the first time, it's like a new world. Yeah, where you, was band camp? Where were you? Saratoga Springs. Oh, so you took a big trip. This yes. was not a nothing. All oh. right. Upstate New York. So you were already, <laughs> what instrument were you playing, John, at the time? Piano. And I saw her in the courtyard. And this is, you know, again, I thought this was maybe a New York thing. People wear Birkenstocks. <laughs> Nobody was wearing that in New Orleans. <laughs> no, they weren't. Those were not cool in New Orleans. And I thought it, it would, what immediately came to my mind was, oh, she's like a, a hippie. <laughs> 
you know, like granola, like <laughs> that vibe. Crunchy granola. Uh, and how did you, at 13, were you, at, did you have any confidence level at 13? Or were you like a lot of 13 year old girls? You did? She did. Definitely. I was what? a 13 year old Definitely. going on 20. I thought I was far more mature than I actually was. That's Definitely. impressive. <laughs> Most 13 year old girls feel so incredibly awkward. I was just coming out of what I call UDS, ugly duckling syndrome. <laughs> I'd just gotten contacts for the first oh, time to replace my, uh-huh. my bottle Definitely. thick glasses. Okay, so now at 13, that's when the crushes start happening. Did, was there a crush or were you all just friends? No, no, no crush. Yeah. I would. I was very much a uh, late bloomer. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I was into music and video games uh-huh. and martial arts and chess. <laughs> things like Eclectic. that. Eclectic. You got a nice array. Uh, all the nerdy activities. <laughs> yeah. I was about to say all the introspective kind okay. of uh, introvert activities. Yeah. So you see. So like when you saw him, was did you just thought a, a, a nice kid, nice guy? <laughs> I remember thinking he was a little strange because I I think I tried to initiate a conversation and conversation was not happening. You were not into it. You just weren't a conversationalist then. I think. There's a glorious awkwardness <laughs> in uh, coming into your own at that age. Yeah, and it's I think weird. I, it's it's strange, but a beautiful strange. And I feel like I've kept that until adulthood. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I still, you know, I feel like we probably tried to speak, and at that time, anybody who I talked to, yeah, and she's always been a great communicator, yeah. always magnetic, always yeah. able to communicate. She's got it the emotions that other people are feeling I, I noticed that about her immediately yeah. um but there was no crush we 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 linked later in college and that's when we started to really become more friends you know what's weird mm-hmm. i on my first my first week at juilliard i was on the one train with my friend michelle and i had no you know i hadn't thought about john since band camp several years earlier which when you're a teenager feels like a decade (laughs) and I see this young man on the train who is singing to himself and playing the air piano and people were kind of staring because even in New York that's not a site that you see every day and I looked at him and I turned to my friend and I said that's John Batiste, what is he doing here? And I said, that's the man I'm gonna marry someday. Wait, And I just wait, blurted wait, it out wait, and forgot stop about it. it. St- I wanna stop for a second. <laughs> On the one train, you knew you were gonna marry John? It, it was like one of those things you just say, and I didn't think about it, and I didn't give it much weight. <laughs> so is that the last you see of her before you know she's not feeling well? No, mm-hmm. we, we saw each other. This is in college, my yeah. first year, her, last year of high school then she doesn't end up going to Juilliard. Right. she goes to princeton then right. at princeton she has this um incredible time we don't see each other in passing we see each other at performances here and there right. we have mutual friends but we're not really as connected, connected. yeah then she has a going away party because she's moving you move into paris and i went to the going away party with a mutual friend of ours mm-hmm. but then that was when there was a, a spark at that party the oh. going away party but oh, she was going away. Going to Paris. So bye. That it was not, you know, oh, the time. You were pining, John, <laughs> a little, a little. You're pining we a little. Had, uh, a moment. Uh-huh. We had a moment. Well, you got to have a moment. I mean, come on, going to Paris, y'all. There's love in the air. Yes. Okay, so let's fast forward to how did you learn that Suleika was was ill, was not well? So that same friend Michelle told me one day we. Um, were playing, you know, my band, we would play in public places often, mm-hmm. you know, for, not for money, just to bring mm-hmm. the music, revelry, mm-hmm. joy. Uh, we were playing in the subway one mm-hmm. day, and um, mm-hmm. she told me, and I gathered the rest of my band, because at this time it was just a few of us, mm-hmm. and I gathered the rest of them, and we went to the hospital. Mm-hmm. And, and um, you know, I hadn't heard that she was that ill until that moment. Mm-hmm. It was a It was a real moment of clarity that I had to do something and what I do is music I just felt I needed to bring that to the situation to help in any way that I could so that's what I did but that must have been emotional because you didn't expect to to see her in that way I I, I guess there's an impact that a person has on you that you don't know the full extent of until you're in a moment of Mm -hmm. crisis so it felt like I needed to do something in that moment even though we weren't 
super close friends, it felt like, oh, I really connect with this person. I respect this person, what she's all about, what I know of her. This is this is important. So that's why we went to the, the hospital. We played, and it was a beautiful experience. Did you feel like you were doing some good? Yes. I, I felt like we were doing good, but that's that was a, a special thing for our relationship, a special time to to – you know, you see each other through these different phases and you see what a person is like when they're 13, 14. Then you see what a person is like at the beginning of college. Then you see what a person is like when they finish college and going out into the world. Then you see what a person is like when they're going through tremendous duress, the impact of that on their life, meeting the family, understanding, you know, how that impacts a whole community. But it's also <laughs> a testament to John because John is someone who who shows up in the difficult moments and who keeps on showing up, not just for me, but for everybody. Mm. Um, and he's always been that way. <laughs> well, I, you, you, you gotta show them. <laughs> you gotta show people you love them. Mm -hmm. I, I urge everybody out there, you show the person in your life who you haven't told, uh, you haven't shown your love, show them. So what's, uh, what's the future with you two? Well, you, we were talking about the uh, the kids mm -hmm. you, that 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 you have in your life that's a beautiful thing to have family we uh, we look forward to something in that realm you know there's complications yeah um, you know I don't I, I don't I don't feel like that is ever a barrier to no. family because you it's can not. you can plenty figure of ways out. to make mm -hmm. a family right yeah I, I think it's possible it's it's all about love well and I'll just say. Like, I think one of my big anxieties coming out of this illness was finding a partner who understood that mm -hmm. and who wasn't sort of scared of having hard conversations or awkward mm -hmm. conversations around things. Um, and I remember talking to John about infertility early on mm -hmm. uh, as a result of my treatment. And he said, there are many ways to make a family. Mm -hmm. And it's its own kind of creative act. And you've just been understanding and, and open in a way that I wish were the norm, um, wow. but that I feel very grateful for. Is She's got to be real. Come. She's a very real person. By the way. Eloquent, <laughs> but she can say <laughs> she's real. So you, it's easy to have real, authentic conversations. Well, you know, I think John is one of the most creatively brilliant people I know, but what I've loved observing and learning from is the way creativity informs every aspect of his life, including our relationship. Mm. And so one example of that is we both travel a lot for work in non-pandemic times. And because of that, have to spend sometimes several weeks apart. And he came up with this idea early on in our relationship, which was to write each other a letter mm. every day by hand. Instead of doing like your morning morning pages or writing in a journal, he would write a letter by hand, take a photo of it, and text it to me. And I it brought me that. back to those letters <gasps> that I got on the road trip. Oh, wow. And mm. I think that there's sometimes certain things that you can only say in the written word that you don't even maybe know you need to say that come out when you're writing letters. Um, but you're always doing stuff like that. You're always finding creative ways for mm -hmm. us to deepen our relationship and to stay connected. By the way, that is the most beautiful and thoughtful and smart. I was thinking, write a letter, but how are you ever gonna get it? You take a picture and text it so you can actually read the handwriting. Brilliant. Right? <laughs> Joel and I are stealing that. Thank you. <laughs> I have to tell you, it's so beautiful because watching your story from the beginning unfold, and I've been I've been reading and watching a lot leading up to this interview, and sitting here in this moment and looking at you two is so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Love is in the air, baby. Aww. Yes. <laughs> All right, Suleika, John, thank you guys so much. We appreciate you being on Making Space. Well, happy.
Happy Tuesday to all you streaming today, all day, and welcome to Popstar Plus. I'm Carson Daly. This is a place where you can find celebrity news and interviews on everything from movies, music, TV, and a whole lot more. Earlier this morning, Hoda had the good fortune to chat with our buddy Tracy Morgan ahead of the new season of his show, The Last OG. Stick around. Very inspiring conversation. Also, great chat with Leah Rimini and Demi Lovato. All that coming up later on the show. But first, Popstar. It's pop star time, yeah. which means best time of the day. Yeah. Mandalorian, hit best, me, baby. The best time of the day is going to be when Tracy Morgan's on live television. Oh, yeah. oh, that's the most dangerous time, time of the day. my guy Tracy over there. Woo. Up, Trace. Trace. Oh, Tracy. Hey. Hey. The OG. Oh. Tracy Morgan's yeah. saying, oh, yes. Looks like he's Sorry about your yeah. Knicks yeah. last night, but, you know. Tracy's doing though. weather. Yeah. Uh, first up at pop star today, we've got Glamour's Women of the Year Awards. This year's theme is women who have reshaped the world, and we have an exclusive first look at not one, but six incredible covers featuring these awesome honorees. So check it out. There's Inauguration Day poet Amanda oh, Gorman, yeah. our favorite Law & Order star Mariska Hargitay, who was just here recently, singer Megan Thee Stallion, as oh. well as Dr. Catalin Carrico, who researched, uh, her, whose research aided the development of not one, but two COVID-19 vaccines. Mm. Three community leaders named Democracy's Defense Defenders and food and security advocates behind the Heart of Dinner organization. Glamour names these honorees all female game changers, rule breakers, and boundary pushers. Mm -hmm. So big congratulations going out to the new class of women of the year. Next up, the weekend of Mariah Carey. Before oh. we can talk about the Queen of Christmas, we have to give a shout out to the weekend, who maybe now is the king of Halloween. I just saw this late yesterday. We're used to seeing his face bandaged up a little bit, but never like this. Look at the weekend. Oh, what? Wait, he completely what? unrecognizable in a series of photos that he posted to Instagram following Halloween. Wow. Completely transforming oh. himself into Marlon Brando's godfather, wow. Vito Corleone. It's that's the that's weekend. Unbelievable. That's unbelievable. Yeah. That's, that's, that's amazing. Have you ever have you seen any no. anybody? No, he wins Halloween. Win. That was that's awesome. Nobody better yeah. than that. It's a heck of a amazing. That's amazing. amazing. That is just crazy. So <laughs> you win. But let's move on to Christmas now. Nobody does Christmas like Mariah Carey. Once the clock struck midnight on November first, the All I Want for Christmas is You singer announced it is officially the holiday season, completely bypassing Thanksgiving. <laughs> Carrie smashed the Halloween pumpkins with her candy cane. <laughs> Yikes. That totally and brought out the Santa costume overnight. Carrie released a quick tease for a brand new holiday song that she has with Khalid and Kirk Franklin. It's called oh, okay. Fall in Love at Christmas. Here's a taste. <laughs> Thanksgiving. Poor thing is just getting leapfrogged. Yeah. yeah. Who's repping Thanksgiving? There's no Thanksgiving song. Yeah. Turkey's That's out. We've got to come up with one. We should. I think we should. Fall in love. Let's do it. Christmas okay. is out. Pete Breen, we want a Thanksgiving song. Next up, Adele, as fans wait for her highly anticipated new album to finally come out in a couple weeks. Adele is sharing a new peek at the upcoming project. Yesterday, the Grammy winner releasing the official track listing for the 30. That's the Target exclusive deluxe CD version of the release. Uh, revealing 15 songs on the album, a couple of bonus tracks, one of which is oh. a country, uh, well, Chris Stapleton is on Easy On Me with her, oh. kind of a new take on that. Fans online were talking about track number seven, however, it's called I Drink Wine. <laughs> okay. One writing on Twitter, baby, I just know for a fact that I Drink Wine is going to have me going through it. Oh. Another adding, how appropriate Adele has songs called I Drink Wine and Cry Your Heart Out, as I'm quite sure I'll be doing both of those <laughs> yeah. things yeah. while listening to this new album. Yeah. Next up, Star Wars after The Mandalorian brought us the gift that is Baby Yoda. Disney has just released the trailer for the latest spinoff in the saga starring another beloved character from the franchise. Actor Timura Morrison leads the cast as the Book of Boba Fett. The new series headed to Disney Plus was first teased at the end of The Mandalorian's most recent season. It'll follow Boba Fett as he reclaims the land of Tatooine from Jabba the Hutt. Yes. Why speak of conflict? When cooperation can make us all rich. What prevents us all from killing you and taking what we want? Yep, I'm in. Okay. Book of Boba <laughs> Fett starts streaming on December 29th. Happy New Year. Mm -hmm. Finally, Leah Remini, the former King of Queens star, recently sat down with Hoda for the latest episode of Quoted By, and Leah shared her favorite words of wisdom by author Viktor Frankl. If there is meaning in life at all, then there must be meaning in suffering. In the book, he talks about finding meaning 
-hmm. in your pain and purpose in your pain. And I'm often given that giving that advice, like what can you take from this unbearable pain that you're living with mm -hmm. and turn it into some kind of purpose. And now to the reason we call the show Popstar Plus. A few more headlines for you, including some great new music to share. Let's kick things off with Tim McGraw. And it looks like Mariah Carey isn't the only one getting an early jump on Christmas. McGraw is out today with a new holiday track called Christmas All Over the World. Here's a listen. Might be time to start an official campaign for a full-length Tim McGraw holiday album. He's got our vote. And U2. It's a beautiful day for fans of the beloved rock band because they've officially joined TikTok. U2 making their big debut on the platform Monday to drop a sneak peek of their upcoming single called Your Song Saved My Life. That's from the movie Sing 2. Take a listen. Now that YouTube is officially on TikTok as a platform, that means their entire catalog of music is also available for other TikTok users to use. So the next viral dance trend could very well be to a U2 song, maybe with or without you. Vertigo, take your pick. And those are your Pop Star Plus headlines. Up next, our visit here in Studio 1A with the last OG himself, our friend Tracy Morgan. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show. In a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. Yes, yes. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready, are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. That's just Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. Tracy Morgan always makes us laugh. We love when he's here. This time he and Hoda were hanging out. They caught up just ahead of the season premiere of his show, The Last OG. Welcome back. If you're looking for a good laugh, you come to the right place because one of the funniest guys around, Tracy Morgan is with us. He is no stranger to our house right here in 30 Rock. But right now, Tracy is starring in The Last OG. It's in its fourth season, and he also is an executive producer on the show. Yeah. I got to tell you, Tracy, I sat down, and people probably expect you right when you sit down to just, like, laugh, laugh, laugh. Mm. The first thing you said to me is you brought up your little 8-year-old daughter. Oh, that's Mae. my baby. She's everything to you, That's huh? my... I call her... St yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. That's my stinking mama. She's very close to me. We are very close. That's my baby, and she's my greatest co-star ever. Yeah. Why does ever. it, just saying her name, why does that bring all these emotions out? Well, Maven, because uh, she was 10 months old when I got hit by the truck. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people don't just come out of comas. I had to fight. I knew I had to be here for her. Mm. And I wanted to see my daughter. I've always wanted a daughter, and I have a female version of me. <laughs> and I'm looking at her every day as she grows under my gaze. And I love her. Mm. And right now, I'm teaching her about time. 
with my daughter, I want to give her the base, basic coping mechanisms to deal with how she feels inside. Mm -hmm. I simply ask her, how do you feel? Mm -hmm. I want her to have the opportunity to tell me how she feels every day. Mm. I don't care how you're feeling. Yeah. Talk to dad. We can work it out. When you just said she was just months old when you were in that accident, right. I cannot believe. Was it, tw it was 2014 when you were in that coma. Right. And you were out for months. Yeah. Um, and you recently went back to the hospital where the doctors treated you. And what was that like, Trey? For me, it was surreal. Uh, they remember everything. I didn't remember anything. Mm -hmm. I had traumatic brain damage, so I didn't remember anything. And they would tell me everything that happened. Mm -hmm. And I got to the bed that I recovered in, and I just dropped to my knees and started crying because everything came before my face. Jimmy Mack, the truck, mm -hmm. my friends that was in the car with me, all of that stuff came right before me, mm. and it was there. Mm. And you remember, you started to have those memories. Yeah. What was it like? This I found this so interesting. But in the show, you're 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 in this fourth season of right. uh, of the OG. Um, you actually play someone who has a traumatic brain injury. Yeah. I thought that must have been so weird. Like, was what was surreal. that like? It was surreal. It was surreal. Just you're looking down. It's like looking at yourself down in the bed, and you saying, "Lord, have mercy." Mm. That was me. You know, I was just close to it. I was knocking on the door. And to be able to put it in, in I had people around me that helped me because I don't remember that stuff. So I had other people around me that was there to tell me, no, nah, it was this way and that way. I do remember rehabbing. Mm -hmm. they sent, the hospital sent me a young lady mm -hmm. and I just ran all over her. And then they sent me another lady mm -hmm. that wasn't older, more experienced, mm -hmm. and she wasn't having it. She would use profanity with me and everything. Oh, she did. And the first thing she said to me was, I don't want to see you limping no more. I don't she, for months, she, we would work. It was a lot of screaming. I would work in my kitchen. My daughter would be sitting in her little bassinet. She was a little bit older, and I was working. I, w I was about to be married. I wanted to be married. I was engaged to Megan, uh -huh. and um, I wanted to walk my wife down the aisle mm. without a cane. Mm. So I worked really hard. Mm -hmm. I went hard, and now I'm back on my feet. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much for getting me back on my feet. Do you feel 100%, Trey, right now? I don't think none of us are 100%. Yeah, yeah. But I feel well. Yeah. I don't know about tomorrow. I don't, I don't have nothing to do with tomorrow. I know today I'm sitting here talking to you. I feel <laughs> great. I feel blessed. Yeah. I feel very, very, I don't say lucky, because luck, if luck is for losers. Yeah. If you want luck, you got to go to Atlantic City yeah. or Vegas. Yeah. I feel fortunate. Yeah. So now I'm helping. You feel like God's in your life? Yeah, he's always been in my life. Yeah. This accident just brought me closer. Mm. My father introduced me to God. Mm -hmm. my, you know who God is? They say, you know one knows how he looks and nothing. I know how God looks. He looked mm. like Jimmy Morgan, mm -hmm. my father, because mm. my father made it possible for me mm. every day. Mm. And now you're. Him and my mom. Yeah. And, and now... Lisa Morgan. And now you're making it possible for your little girl. Well, for them, for my sons and my daughter, I just want to leave a legacy. Mm -hmm. When I'm long gone dead, I want them to go to the, my star in Hollywood and say, that's my grandpa, my mm -hmm. great, great, great grandkid. That's my grandfather. Mm -hmm. And they can build on top of that. Mm -hmm. Well, Tracy, you certainly do leave a legacy. Uh, you I love showed... you. You know that. I love you right now. Day back. one, you know that. I was a baby when I first started being interviewed by you. I was a baby. But I'm here now. I'm a big boy. I've been through some stuff. You sure have. And you're still standing. Yeah, I'm here. Well, well we appreciate you, Trace. You can catch an all-new episode of The Last OG. It's tonight on TBS. Tracy, we love you. We're happy you're here. In one piece, too. Love Tracy. So inspiring. You can catch the new season of The Last OG on TBS. And coming up after the break here on Popstar Plus, words to live by from Demi Lovato and Leah Remini. We'll be right back. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. 
Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends at Today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Shop today with Joe Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day Kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. People really don't know what's going to happen. Only a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. <laughs> There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. By the man who never did. All right, it just did too. for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. This is fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Pop Star Plus. Nobody loves a good quote, as you know, more than Hoda. Well, for her latest edition of Quote Advice, she got Demi Lovato and Leah Remini to share their favorite words of wisdom. We're going to start with Demi, and then we'll get to Leah. Once we start really talking to each other, we realize that we are all connected by some kind of pain. Everybody has some kind of pain in their lives. So I always say, you're going through this and I want you to get through it mm. and then find a way to help another through what you're going through right now. Welcome to the Quoted by series. I love this because I get to ask my favorite people sort of what their favorite quote is. They're kind of North Star. And I'm joined by Leah Remini, who, by the way, always makes us laugh. But oh, thank you. in this moment, I know that there's mm -hmm. a quote that's kind of a North Star for you um, that, that you're kind of guided by. What's your quote, Leah? Okay, so there's a few, right? But this is one of many, okay? Life is never made unbearable by circumstances, but only by lack of meaning and purpose. Mm. Um, and there's another quote that I love by him. If there is meaning in life at all, then there must be meaning in suffering. And I, I just realized that we are all, once we start really talking to each other, we realize that we are all connected by some kind of pain. Everybody has some kind of pain in their lives, some kind of trauma. And uh, in the book, he talks about finding meaning Mm -hmm. in your pain and purpose in your pain and I'm often given that giving that advice like what can you take from this unbearable pain that you're living with mm -hmm. and turn it into some kind of purpose where you can help another where you can find why what is your why mm -hmm. now you have to find the why in your suffering and we oftentimes think of suffering as big big traumas or big sufferings but everybody's dealing with something mm -hmm and uh, to find the purpose and mm. that suffering is everything. We all have a different why, right? We all can find a different purpose. I mean, I talk to people on Twitter all the time, privately in my DMs, and you know, I always say, you're going through this and I want you to get through it mm. and then find a way to help another through what you're going through right now. That's, oh, I love, that's my favorite part because some people carry their pain with them all the way and some people figure out how to share it and help other people. Leah Remini, yes. I adore you. I adore you. Bye-bye. I do this little series called Quoted By, and I love it because it sort of shows me who, what the North Star is for, for my guest, mm -hmm. something that guides you. And what's, what's yours? Mine I actually have tattooed on oh. my hand. And it says, love will live forever in the infinite universe. Mm. And that is kind of a quote for me. It's from a song called Infinite Universe. Mm. And it's by this group called A Beautiful Chorus. Mm. And I am just completely inspired by this song. It kind of makes me feel like there's a bigger purpose out there mm. that is not just us. It kind of goes back to this whole conversation mm -hmm. of wanting to expand our consciousness mm -hmm. and 
Um, mm. Yeah. I love that. That's a beautiful quote. Thank You'll never you. forget it because it's written yes. right there. <laughs> What an inspiring duo, love that. Hey, next week on Popstar Plus, Reba McIntyre is gonna share her favorite quote with Hoda, so stick around for that. Also, Friends fans, are you out there? You're not gonna wanna miss a great interview with the cast that we're pulling straight from the vault. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're gonna do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life. In primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove, because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back! The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. You know whose birthday is today? 55 years young, David Schwimmer. So, let's go back to 1994 when a little TV show here on NBC called Friends was about to premiere. And today was given the chance to interview the cast on set. Let's go right to today's From the Vault. It's 8.14 and I decided to come next door to pay a house call to the cast and crew of another NBC Thursday night show called Friends. It's become quite a hit this season. So joining me here on the Friends couch are all six members of the Friends cast. Jennifer Aniston, Courtney Cox, Lisa Kudrow, Matt LeBlanc, Matthew Perry, and David Schwimmer. Good morning. Good, morning. Good evening. Can you believe we got up this early to do this? Thanks you all for coming in. What do you mean get up? <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah. We're still sleeping. You're, are you still sleeping? We we're just here rehearsing anyway. Yeah, this is the time we n normally rehearse. They like us to be really wide awake, three really, or four in the morning. Really when we do fresh. Our stuff. Hey, for people who haven't seen the show, you guys, can you describe what it's all about? Who wants to do this? Come all raise your hands at once. Okay, David. Yes. Oh. Uh, the show. <laughs> Uh, the show's about uh, six uh, individuals who uh, live in the Big Apple, and uh, each of them has separate careers and uh, love interests, and um, are, are in that phase of their lives where they're they're not relying on their parents anymore for financial uh, stability, and and are not yet settled with uh, a husband or wife, or or, or, or I was, but um, or, or kids, um, and so we're in that kind of gray area where we're relying on our friends for uh, kind of emotional support and spiritual support and trying to make it on our own in the, in the big city. So. As you all well know, you know, we've spent some time talking to the cast of, of ER and they say it's really, the show is the star, it's an ensemble cast. Do you all feel that way? Do you feel like the show really evolves around a single character or, or it's more the interaction between all of you? Jennifer, I feel like a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, oh, it's absolutely, it's it's the entire cast together, working together, we're, we communicate well, we have a great time during rehearsal, and it's just uh, the entire combination makes it, uh, makes it gel. You know, a lot of people say this is a hot show for Generation X. Oh! <laughs> I know, I know, oh. I know, I know, I know, I know you hate that. But, of course, that's how it's been described by some people, that 20-somethings uh, love this show. But you all, why don't you like that, Courtney? Why does that bug you, that whole term? Well, it's just very personal to me, actually, um, the whole Generation X thing. <laughs> <We're here. laughs> um, uh, does anyone have a tissue? <laughs> no, um, I, I don't know why, it actually, the, uh, truthfully, I don't even know why it's that negative. Um, Generation X, I guess, implies that we're all aimless and we're just kind of hanging out listening to, you know, music and watching the Brady Bunch or something. I don't know, which we do. But I think that um, it's, it just implies that we're aimless and we're not. We all know where we're going and we're trying to get there. And I, of course, am there. 
I'm doing what I want to do, sorry. Yeah, exactly. Um, You're sort of the stable member of the cast. Well, I'm, aren't I'm you? the chef, so I'm the chef. <laughs> That's what I am. Need I say more? Chef. I think I've said it all. And Lisa, tell me about your character quickly, because you are the same. Uh, well, you're the twin sister of the person you play on Mad About You, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. And you're about, you're sort of as ditzy as she is, correct? In a different way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> ditzy in a different way, yeah. Uh, very, it's very different. Um, Phoebe listens really carefully, I think, to what everybody's saying. It's just, you know, her response <clears throat> doesn't go through, like, the circuits it would for other people. You know, comes out something different. And Ursula, who's the waitress on Mad About You, doesn't even listen at all. She yeah. doesn't even bother. So you're sort of big, one step higher on the food difference. chain than Ursula. <laughs> yeah, I get eaten by larger animals. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, we've, <laughs> we've got a clip of tonight's show. It's uh, Thanksgiving on tonight's episode of Friends, and Monica is cooking a turkey dinner for the gang, but you run into a slight problem after you step out for a bit. Uh-oh. Let's take a look, shall we? Well done. Right about now, the turkey should be crispy on the outside, juicy on the inside. <laughs> Why are we standing here? We're waiting for you to open the door. You've got the keys. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> yes, you do. When we left, you said, got the keys. No, I didn't. I asked, got the keys? <laughs> no, no, no. You said, got the keys. Do either of you have the keys? <laughs> Oh, wait, wait, we have a copy of your key. Well, then get it, get it! Hey, hey, that tone won't make me go any faster. <laughs> Joey? That one will. Now, Ma oh, well, the three girls, but I have a question, actually, for one of the Matts, you guys. I was going to say, Matt, are you surprised that the show has been so successful? It's like the number two comedy, isn't it? Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. I uh, number two is. new comedy. Really? Yeah, did you know that? No. Oh. Hey. Hey. I mean, it, <laughs> yes, you did. So you guys are pulling my no, leg, no, aren't you? Didn't know that. You didn't? Well, gosh, I'm so glad I could educate you here this morning. But I, I mean, is it, kind of a is it kind of a shock that the yeah, show has been so successful, or what do you think about it? It's pretty amazing. I mean, I think we're all really sort of taken aback by it because to us down here, it just seems like we're all just a sort of a theater group. You know, we're all an a really tight ensemble. We get along really well, and it's just a real productive environment. We yeah. have a great time. Now, Matt, too, what were you doing before you landed this role? Oh, I was on every canceled show that George Clooney wasn't on. <laughs> <laughs> before Clooney. Was. Can you name some of your greatest hits for us or your worst hits, I guess? Oh, oh I don't know if we want to go down that painful road. Uh, <laughs> um, I was on a show called Boys Will Be Boys for a while and another show. Uh, uh, this show is, I, I like this show. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are having a good time, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Having a great time. It doesn't could be happy. Do you worry about staying power? I mean, I would think that getting there is one thing, <clears> and <throat> just worrying that you're going to be a flash in the pan success. Uh, is that something that concerns you, or just are you just sort of enjoying things as well, they are right now? Enjoying things, absolutely, but the work is important. You can't sort of get lazy and sort of sit back, hey, we're a hit, we're going to be fine. You can, yeah. You know, Got to keep up the. Uh, the momentum. Up the momentum and keep up the goods. Anybody, keep up our time slot. I mean, yeah. yeah, exactly. That's key. <laughs> Anybody going to get together, like, romantically? Oh, why? <laughs> what, what other news do you have for us? <laughs> uh, I'll talk to you during the commercial. Oh, you and me? Yeah, I've got, well, I've got some, oh, the two of you, I'm so jealous. some, maybe some bad news for you. Just kidding. <clears throat> okay. All right, David, Matt, Matt, I'm just kidding. Lisa, Courtney, and Jennifer at the cast of Friends, thanks so much for getting up so early to mm -hmm. talk with us this morning. Wow, they look so young. Talk about a blast from the past. You know, it's been almost 30 years ago from that whole beginning of the phenomenon. All right, so that's going to do it for Popstar Plus today. But good news, come back. You'll hang out with us again tomorrow. We've got a great show, more from the latest headlines, and a fun conversation with YouTube sensation Liza Koshy. We'll see you then.
Pay Today All Day. We've got a great show for you on this Tuesday morning, including an all-day exclusive chat you can only see here. We kick it off with Carson giving us all the buzzy headlines with Pop Start. Best time of the morning. There it is. Time Pop is. Start at his coffee. Bam! Thank you, Uncle Al. Appreciate it. Good morning, everybody. Let's get right to it. First up, Princess Diana. A reception at Kensington Palace to remember Diana and thank those who contributed to make a new tribute statue possible set to take place tonight. Pop Start correspondent Molly Hunter is here with all the details. Hey, Molly. <laughs> Hey guys, good morning from a very windy Kensington Palace. That's right, so Kensington Palace says tonight is a private event. We understand that there will be a lot of high profile donors and benefactors there to celebrate the legacy of Princess Diana. This morning, preparations are underway for a party fit for a princess. Months after Prince William and Prince Harry unveiled this statue of their mother in a small, intimate gathering, today a larger private reception postponed because of COVID, a moment to acknowledge those who made the statue possible. This wasn't paid by the British nation. It wasn't paid by the UK government. It was paid by donations and benefactors. Now open to the public, overlooking the sunken garden at Kensington Palace, the statue depicts Princess Diana as a humanitarian, surrounded by three children. Both brothers worked closely with the sculptor to bring their vision to life, reuniting on what would have been Diana's 60th birthday. There had even been some hope that the memory of their mother might heal the rift between them. We all kept our fingers crossed that this was going to be an occasion that would bring the boys together. Those hopes were dashed when the unveiling happened and then I think people thought well maybe October will be the moment they'd come together and those hopes have been dashed. But today only one of her sons, the country's future king, will be here to greet Princess Diana's supporters. Harry, Meghan, Little Archie and Lilibet are not crossing the pond for today's ceremony, a sign that all may not be healed. At home in the U.S., Harry and Meghan recently teaming up with the Wall Street firm Ethic after a whirlwind trip to New York City last month. While here in the UK, Prince William focusing on the Earthshot Prize, the star-studded environmental awards over the weekend, speaking passionately about climate change. We need some of the world's greatest brains and minds fixed on trying to repair this planet. Both sons separately doing the kind of work that would make their mother so proud. Now, Carson, of course, big question. Are we going to see those brothers together anytime soon? You heard Daisy McAndrew says there are a lot of crossed fingers on this side of the Atlantic that maybe, just maybe, Harry and Meghan might fly a little Lilibet over over Christmas for her very first visit. Carson, I'll send it back to you. Fingers crossed here, Molly. Thank you yeah. so much. Over 10 years of hard-hitting journalism. It means a lot on Popstar yeah. to get yeah. Molly's uh -huh. professionalism. Yeah. That's yeah. Matrix yeah. Award That's material right yes, there. It is. Yeah. Molly Hunter. Yeah, and they have Appreciate nitwits it. riding behind people yeah. just yeah. like the, and the bike. The guy yeah. in the bike is yeah. excited yeah. for the story. Yeah. Uh, next up, Mel Brooks, a 95-year-old comedy legend, is back with a new take on one of his classics. Brooks set to write and produce a sequel series to the 81 movie History of the World Part 1. The original film told the story of civilians throughout history with Brooks's classic slap style, uh, slapstick style of comedy. The upcoming eight-part variety series based on the movie will be co-written and produced by Nick Kroll, Wanda Sykes, and Ike Barinholtz. A cast for the History of the World Part 2 has yet to be announced, but the series is set to stream on Hulu. 95, writing and producing. 95, okay. Yeah. Incredible. Oh. Next up, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. The lineup of the star-studded presenters for this year's ceremony has officially been announced, and they are Taylor Swift, Paul McCartney, Drew Barrymore, Jennifer Hudson, Lionel Richie, and Christina Aguilera. They're all going to help to induct the incoming class of Hall of Famers. This year's ceremony will celebrate a number of first-time inductees, including the Go-Go's and Jay-Z and mark the second honor for three other artists, Tina Turner, Carol King, and Foo Fighters frontman Dave Grohl. The 36th annual Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony will take place on Saturday, October 30th. It'll air on HBO, HBO Max, and Sirius XM. Uh, and finally, Hoda, it's all about you. Huh? Yesterday, you were among the honorees at the 2021 Matrix Award Ceremony, well, an annual event that celebrates the most outstanding female leaders in the field of communications. Our good friend, your close friend, Maria Shriver, was there mm -hmm. to present you with the award. And in typical Hoda fashion, you left us with some lovely pearls of wisdom in your speech. If you want something bad enough, say it out loud. A friend once said, even if you whisper it in the bathroom mirror to yourself, one thing I always wanted was kids, and I was afraid to speak it. And one day I just looked at Joel, and I basically said, I want you to think about this for a minute. I want you to take some time 
because I'm about to ask you something very important. Take a week and think about it. And he looked scared. And I looked at him and I said, I would like to explore adoption with you. And he paused for a nanosecond and said, I don't need a week. I don't need a minute. The answer is yes. So say your dreams out loud. If you speak them, sometimes they do come true. I want a new Ford F-150 wow, Raptor. Yeah. I want a new Ford. <laughs> I want a new Ford. By the way, Carson, Raptor. Yeah. Carson, 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 you're so shallow. Yeah. What? Carson, yeah. Carson, Carson yeah. is it here? No, Carson, sorry. Carson, oh. do you know who the friend was who told me to speak it out loud? No. Even if you whisper it in Oprah? the bathroom mirror. Oh, so Bingo. Um, well, for, a former Matrix winner. That's right. That's right. Oh, that's right. Where's your Matrix? Where's Popstart's Matrix? The honorable mention is uh, coming. It's for <laughs> ladies, right? Yeah. It's a ladies. Well, well, our friend Molly Hunter, the journalist. <laughs> yes. Yeah, journalist. You can exactly. give the speech to your pickup truck. That would, yeah, that would be I good. will. I have one written already. I just need the truck. Congratulations, <laughs> Hoda. Congratulations. That's so awesome. Yeah, that was amazing. Fantastic. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Well deserved. Right. Uh, what if we want more pop stars? Well, it's a good yeah. question, Savannah. There's an answer to that because I am now hosting a 30 minute pop star show called Pop Star Plus on wow. our streaming channel today all day. You get the latest in entertainment, celebrity news, and some amazing moments from the Today Vault. It is weekdays at 12:30 p.m. You go to today.com to watch, and we invite you to join us today. That's all great. right, thank you, Carson. Coming up next on Today Talks in the third hour, the gang goes full on overheard on third. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. Yes, yes, yes. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. People really don't know what's going to happen. Only a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. By the man, the All right, it just did too. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. Didn't fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Today in the third hour, it's Overheard on Third, and the gang shows us an impressive and spooky house just in time for Halloween. Take a look. So excited. We have exhumed Overheard on Third. <laughs> Not exhumed. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, for mean, Halloween. Well, it's Halloween. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, if, so if you're looking to an alternative to your daily hor horoscope, you might want to turn to Noodle the Pug. Mm -hmm. A noodle has captivated TikTok with his daily mood and through his bones or no bones videos. So it's a kind of a prediction of what kind of day you might have. His owner, Jonathan Graziano, records a video of the 13-year-old dog every morning. <laughs> if he stands up, Poor guy. it's a bones day. What does cause, that mean? Cause, cause for celebration. So you're gonna have a good day if right. he stands up. That's right, but it's a no bones day uh. when he flops back over onto his doggy bed. That's when his owner advises viewers not to take any risk. It's like an emotional Groundhog's Day. So here's the thing. Yes. People are so into this. This video has racked up more than 10 million views. Yeah. And people were seriously like, okay, he's up. Okay, I'm going to have a good day today. And he's down. I'm just going to be easy today at work. I'm not going to ask yeah. for a raise. No. Okay. I think Noodle's just like, can you leave me alone? I know. He's right. like, can you leave me alone? He's just, like, like, just lay down. He's like, I'm not a groundhog. That's it, bones. Right. Yeah. Speaking of bones, uh, check out these bones. Alan Perkins decorated his Ohio home for Halloween. It looks like a giant skeleton Whoa. is breaking out of the house. <laughs> Uh, and he said he actually didn't damage his actual roof to make this. He's had an idea for this idea for a few years and finally brought it to life. That Look is at that. unbelievable. I, I love people that go overboard with Halloween. Did you, did you I, I love, we never did, but like I love when I drive by a house or in New York, you know, you, you go by a building or a townhouse and it's just it got place. incredible decorations. So people cool. People are spending more, I think, on, on Halloween decorations. They, than are. they are. Actually on Christmas We, decorations. we live in a, in a building and there's one floor in our building where they go insane that the kids get off the elevator and kids just start crying 
because it's so scary. Mm -hmm. But I love that. Yes. I, I think that's fun. That's so the Halloween growing spirit. Growing up, did you guys decorate a house? Or we did a like little that? bit, but we never went overboard. Well, there yeah. was de decorations that involved toilet paper. Yeah, oh, exactly. We did, oh, we did a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, speaking mm -hmm. of Halloween, Huffington Post spoke to nutritionists about giving out healthy candy or alternative snacks to trick or treaters. Mm -hmm. It's a bad idea. It's a don't do that. Don't no apples. No, no, they say depriving kids of candy could actually lead them to binge on candy later in larger quantities. So you know what? I can attest to yes. that in my own house uh -huh. because I was a stickler and still kind of am about candy and no right. gum. I right. talked about this. And what's happened is I've created a monster because yeah. then now when, when they, they get it, it yeah. they, go they're, they go crazy. So I think yeah, slow so, and steady runs the race. You know what was the worst was the um, the pennies. You get to somebody's oh, house please. and they got like a jar of pennies. It was What's like, that? what? Come what is this? And it's gross. Yeah. What's your worst candy? <sighs> like one of those like sort of hard rock candies that you just uh, don't even know what it is. And you're like, yeah. uh, like ambiguous. Why? Candy? Yeah. Are you a fan of the candy corn? The, oh, yeah, I can do a good candy corn. Really? I love candy no, corn. See, that's an oxymoron. There is no good candy corn. Yeah, there is. So you it's don't like candy corn? It's colored wax. Oh, yeah. <laughs> With sugar. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> With it's, sugar. It's the, and by the way, the fun size candy bars. Yes. They're not fun. Well, <laughs> well, they're fun. You just eat a no, hundred of them. They're I mean, not, like yeah, but that's candy, not fun. You eat like five candy bars. You know what would be a fun size bar? What? what? Three times as big as a normal candy bar. <laughs> so there you go. That's go fun. Trick or just go eat your way in, house. hollow it out, and just yeah. live there. Hey, by the way, uh, we're looking to answer your kitchen and conundrums, this time all about Halloween. So okay. go to our third hour today on Instagram or Twitter. Send us your questions, and we're going to try to make cooking this time of year a little less scary. That would be cute. All right. Coming up on Hoda and Jenna, it's Tuesday, Tuesday, where we let you pick our outfits for the week. Today, one of our producers helps style us. Don't miss it. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. International Day of the Girl. The strength and courage of these women is remarkable. What's your message to girls who want to make a difference? Believe in yourself. You can make it happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? the vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's, Let's go. go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Oh. Oh. What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back! This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? the vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back today on Hoda and Jenna. We go unscripted. All right. So uh, this is an interesting topic. So sometimes when a couple splits up, the woman would like to hold on to the name because she wants to. And this is what happened in Kevin Hart's case. Yes. He and his wife uh, got divorced. His ex is uh, Tori. Tori. Yeah, she made headlines because she defended her decision to hang on to his last name. She said, I'm going to be a heart until I decide not to. I be. love that. Yeah. She says she's been asked by women why she still holds on to the heart name. Her response? Because it's mine. Yeah, I think that that is an interesting thing. By the way, something so crazy about last names uh, in the beginning, when my parents first got married in Egypt and came here, the way they do it in Egypt is is the, the woman holds on to her family name because how disrespectful to yeah. your father and your lineage yeah. to just say, well, that's gone. Now I'm now yes. I'm this. So you, you hold on to your last name, and that's just the way it is. So when my parents came here many years ago in the 60s, they tried to book a hotel, and they had different last names. 
and they had a rule at that hotel that you could not book a hotel unless you were married. And they said, well, we are married. And they said, well, no, you're not. Look at your last names. So they found it peculiar that when you came here, you immediately took someone else's name, kind of said goodbye to your family in that way yeah. they saw it. And then, so when you think about how sometimes Middle Eastern countries are seen as really backwards, yes. how kind of progressive, progressive that, that is that was. for the yeah, woman I to keep her name. It's so interesting yeah. because both of you have, both of us yes. have slightly complicated names. Yes. Yours yes. because people couldn't yes. pronounce it. Yes, by a vowel. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And mine because, <laughs> yes, because it was Bush. <laughs> yes. And I remember being at, I went to a big public high yeah. school and I was always like, God, please don't say the full don't name. Say. Just say Jenna. Yeah. Don't say the yeah. full yeah. name. Yeah. Yeah. And poor Barbara had oh. it even worse. Because your grandmother. Because she had a double name. But I think it's interesting. Did you, but when you were, th this is a big question for you, because you're getting married to yeah. Henry. And um, I just wondered, like, was there, did you have a moment where you said, well, hold on. I don't know that I want to. No, I have to say, and yeah. I, like, as I've aged, I'm so proud yeah. of my family and yeah. that name. And I'm like, regained it. But as a young, I was a child bride, yeah. as you yeah. will know. <laughs> and as a younger person, it embarrassed me. I didn't want to uh, be out. You know, I was like, I couldn't wait to, to be Hager. Hager. I couldn't wait to call and make a yeah. dinner reservation with a name that nobody knew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As a teacher, before I got married, I went yeah. by Miss Jenna. Oh, you did? Yeah, I just, yeah. there's something about, but that, that attitude has changed the older I get. Yeah. You know, I think. Do you hyphenate or do you? Well, I was just Jenna Hager and yeah. then I came here yeah. and they were like, but you've published two books under yeah, Bush. Bush. Yeah. So you got to go by Jenna it? Bush Hager hey, and yeah. now I'm JBH and yeah, it all works I, out. JBH does work for you, but I do think you're right. It's whatever makes you feel good and right, yes. you know, yeah. to hang on to. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about Angelina Jolie. Yeah. She took her whole, she's got a beautiful group of kids and she took them all to the premiere of her new uh, film. It's called The Emeralds and they all came on the red carpet yeah, and it's kind of fun. You, is that what, it, did I, yeah. what I say? The Emeralds? <laughs> Emeralds, but I was okay with that too. <laughs> All right. Look at her whole family. They've grown up. Yeah, the, Zahara stood out. She's in that sparkling silver. That gown, look closely, that was the gown her mom wore in 2014 to the Academy Awards. Oh my and gosh. now her daughter is wearing it. So did you know that this is a trend among celebrities? What they're rating that, each other? Yeah, that kids are wearing oh look their mom's tall. clothes. I know. Okay. So here's Brooke Shields' daughter, for example, okay. Rowan. What'd she do? She, she wore her mom's 1998 Golden Globe gown to her high school prom. Okay, that's so cute. Okay, Courtney Cox and her daughter Coco, they shared the same dress. Why is everyone the same size? Well, that's kid? what I'd like to talk that's about. Unbelievable. I'd like to just talk about that for a minute because that's my mom is very small. <laughs> And it's so great. she's like, I, I, she didn't have a big wedding, but she's like, I have the wedding dress in case Barbara wants to wear it. <laughs> <laughs> there was no chance that I was going to squeeze into that wedding dress. <gasps> That's so crazy, though, how these moms and daughters are all so small. small. <laughs> Supermodel Cindy Crawford, her daughter Kaya Gerber, they, they both small? wore one of Cindy's show-stopping bustier looks. Wow. I like to say, imagine me in that. Oh, my God. Not pretty. <laughs> Tracy Ellis Ross, she raided oh, her I mom's her closet. Style. Diana Ross. I mean, oh, my God. I love her style. Wait, that's a ringer. Yeah. Look at Diana Ross but and look at Tracy Ellis Ross. Tracy Ellis Ross has the great taste. Like, she always looks super cool. She, by the way, and she's, in color. she's one of the coolest, yeah. coolest people. So, um, would you raid anybody's closet? I Have you ever worn your mom's clothes? Oh, yeah. I wear my mom and I, yeah. we. You she share has, her clothes? Well, yeah, because she picked, well, she picks my clothes, yeah. and often she picks one for her, so we have the same thing. So it's cute. We do y'all ever match? Sometimes, yeah. You go out and you're well, wearing the same outfit as we, your mom? Well, yeah. I mean, it's not like AKA she goes. Laura she, Ashley yeah, from like, the 80s? Like sweaters. Like she'll get one for her and one for me. Yeah. And you both wear We'll both wear oh. it. Is this well, you that, in the same outfit? No, but you know we like a cold shoulder at our house. Yeah, I and, do know yeah. that. But, but mom, don't you feel like cold shoulders are kind of gone? I think so. You told me they were. You said someone. Uh, yeah. Somebody, somebody told somebody us Somebody told that. us. All right. It's Tuesday's Tuesday, and this is important because... <laughs> we're going to we're going to get someone to help us pick an outfit and we have a very very stylish member of our staff. We adore her. We adore her and she is going to choose what we're going to wear. We all want to dress like Allie Burger, but we don't have no. it. Look, they, look, look at, at Allie. Wait. She's in a jean jumpsuit and by the way, with a jean jacket. And just real quick, this is Allie on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. This isn't like, hey, dress put on something. This is just what she wears. No. So, 
She is our special producer and she's going to help us. And her equally fashionable kids, Joaquin, Valencia, and, and Lucia. Lucia. Yeah, look did at them. Did they pick out their our outfit? Yeah, look how beautiful okay. they are. Did they pick so, out our outfit? This is what Allie did. Allie chose. Okay, okay, so this is what Allie chose. Oh, I Let's love talk her about kids. Hoda's. Here are Hoda's okay. outfits, okay? Oh. Downtown. I Julie like a. Brown. Bay Bay. Okay. I like A and I like B. What do you think? I like all, I can't believe she chose something cool for me. I, that's so I mean, unusual. I'd like to see you in C because two two jeans. Oh, oh look here's at you. Mine. Boom. Boom, boom, boom. You look cute in all those. So just go to uh, hodaandjenna.com, our Instagram page, and reveal your pick. She's very stylish. Yes. I don't know if we can wear it like Allie. Do you think we can? No. Maybe not. No. It is time for Unscripted, and yesterday was the 51st annual Matrix Award, which recognizes New York women in communications. And I am so proud because my dearest Hoda Coffee was among this year's honorees. Here are some of the highlights. Hmm. Hey guys, welcome to today. It's a Tuesday morning. Thanks for joining us. Hoda obviously does a lot. You know, she anchors the Today Show. She has the fourth hour. Hoda does a podcast. Hoda does Sirius XM. I don't know which book she's on. I, I can't even begin to figure that one out. She sews her own clothes. No, I made up the last part. Hoda's story is, is so inspirational because, I mean, she just was up against all odds to even get her first job in television. Here's somebody who literally drove around with a box full of of audition tapes. And everybody said no. And finally, somebody saying, hey, you know, I like you, I'm gonna give you a chance. It's 11 minutes before midnight, I'm Hoda Kotb. She has worked so hard to get where she is, but she never forgets where she's from. Yeah, Hoda does a serious news interview, along with the best of them. She's traveled all around the world, and she also has an amazing way of connecting with people. And that's a gift, and that's what great communicators in this business have, being able to draw other people out. And she has that in spades. I know you said your life's gonna be purposeful, so mm -hmm. what, what is it gonna be? I plan on continuing to magnify this issue. She'll get stuff out of people uh, because it's this kind of, hey y'all, you know, hey, hey, hey. Their guard is down and next thing you know, they're given a hold of the nuclear codes. She had been through breast cancer, she had gone through a divorce, and I think she thought to herself, motherhood is not something that's gonna happen for me. And at some point, she just woke up and she said, well, why not me? Hi. Oh my gosh. Haley and Hope love their mama. Whenever she FaceTimes me, they're having fun, they're screaming, there's yelling, there's dancing. She personifies that. It was never too late to, for your dreams to come true. I think Hoda is a, testament to allowing things to happen in God's time. Things happen when they're meant to happen. She's somebody who's ever evolving and never satisfied to stop learning. And to me, that is a role model for all women in communications. Hoda, congratulations on your Matrix Award. Your career is inspiring. You've put in the work. And there are no words to express how happy I am for you. It's recognition of all your hard work that, that it hasn't gone unnoticed. And hi, hi, even my cat, Sweet Pea, is acknowledging Hoda Kotb. Congratulations, Hoda. I am so proud of you and soak it in. And what took you so long, Matrix? Honestly, right? Oh, oh, congratulations. That was such a nice, I didn't I'm going to just send you the clips of all the nice things I said. <laughs> no, honestly, but I guess there was wasn't time, sweet. but I'll tell you super afterwards. Sweet. Super you sweet. are Thank awesome. You. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, New York Women in Communications, it's a nonprofit, and it raises money for scholarships and educational programs, yeah, okay. so that's cool. You should go. Yeah. Everybody should go right now and see Hoda's remarks at today.com. Today Talks continues after the break. We have an exclusive chat you can only see here on Today All Day. News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're gonna do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening, with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life in prime time and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, 
Download the NBC News app. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go! International Day of the Girl. The strength and courage of these women is remarkable. What's your message to girls who want to make a difference? Believe in yourself. You can make it happen. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Welcome back to Today Talks and our exclusive content you can only see here at Today All Day. So we need to confess that since this day's begun, we've eaten a steak dinner. Um, Actually, if you'd like pie. to see something, I took a picture <laughs> to document because this morning in our morning meeting, you hear a little door knock, and I thought, who's that? And in comes, I don't know if you can scroll in, which camera should I do it to? A full <laughs> three-course meal. And by the third course, I'm talking about her coffee made. Was delivered to Hoda's door. And I'm like, is she going to eat steak and mashed well, potatoes well, for breakfast? On. You know what happened? They had the cooking segment for, with the New York Times lady, Amanda, and she made this beef... Uh, stuff which was yummy. Okay, and, you know, and, and then, then I will say, my brain judged, and there was some laughter and photographs. And then once we started kind of talking, what did I do? You know what you you know what you are. You're like me. You're like a mindless eater. You don't even know because I, then we looked at the plate. And, and the there was beef almost was gone. gone. <laughs> and I think what happens is, and I get this way too, when I'm talking, I'm like, and then what? And then I look at the Dorito bag and go like, what happened? I don't happened? even really eat red meat, and I didn't have a <laughs> fork. I was just eating the meat with my claws, one beef cube at a time. It was so odd. That's right, you didn't have a Why did we do that? I don't know, because we do it. And we did it with the, with the pie that was just here. I think mindless <laughs> eating is one thing that I- We could both work on. Last night, since we're confessing, are we? <laughs> yeah, we're here. Okay, so we get these uh, these ice cream pops. Um, that I've heard are about those really pops. <laughs> <yummy>. <laughs> <laughs> really good. So Joel was out for a dinner and the kids were asleep. And I was sitting down and I was finishing up a book and I was finishing stuff and I ate one. I was like, oh, well. And then I opened the freezer and there were two left. I was like, well, and I'm not. You didn't go I up three. I polished a second. I go up to go to bed and before I walked upstairs, guess what I did? I you went for all I three? I the third one up. I have a problem. I can't stop. Like, and, and the only reason I stopped is because, number one, I was feeling sick, and number two, there were none left in the freezer. Well, and also your children are going to come down, and there's going to be one for two kids. And they always go, what's this wrap? They're so good at finding wrappers. Like, <laughs> did you eat that? Or you smell like chips. I was like, See, oh. I'm not the person. I don't normally act like that in my own home. Don't? I don't know if it's like because I'm hiding Why? from Henry after <laughs> yeah. 27 years yeah. of marriage or what. But Henry's that person, and you hear, like, the kids be like, shaming him. They're like, oh, you know, daddy's daddy's going to eat all our candy later. Like, hide the candy from daddy. You know, and I'm like, thank God that's not me. Wait, have you girls picked their uh, Halloween costumes oh, yeah. yet? Speaking of candy? Um, Mila's going to be a pop star. Oh, that's cute. Yeah. That's cute. Does she um, like to sing for real? Yeah, she does. Oh, she does? Yeah, she plays, she does guitar. For real? On Mondays. Yeah. She has a guitar? <laughs> okay. She has that's a guitar cute. that Randy Travis gave her. What? I know. When I interviewed Does him. she know like what a big I've deal I play that is? music of Randy oh, Travis to her constantly oh, so she understands. Okay. But and then um, Poppy's gonna be Glenda the Good Witch. Okay, cute. Which will be cute. And how's gonna be Elvis. <laughs> Why is Hal gonna be Because mommy because? gets to pick the costume. <laughs> <laughs> I only got a few. And are you years and Henry left. gonna do it or are you um, gonna guess? Yeah, I think well Mila wants me to be a pop star. Too. Okay, so you'll go with her. But and what I about mean, Henry? And he's every year he picks like a hat <laughs> from the closet and he's like, This year I'm a <laughs> You know, like work at Starbucks. I'm like, well, that doesn't really work because that's, we'll see. That's good. Okay, yeah. that'll be fun. And I wonder what about what, you? Um, we're doing like um, unicorn for Haley, rainbow for Hope. They want to do those, and Joel and I it's will be. It's basically inside Hoda Copy's brain. <laughs> <laughs> you should call that inside Hoda Copy's brain. But somebody needs to unicorn, be. rainbow, sunshine. By the way, here's the thing about life everyone was like, you know, all these Halloween movies are so scary yeah. and all that stuff. No, thank you. No, honey. No, thank like, you. This is it. Whatever comes in goes out. 
whatever and comes when in, it goes, goes out, out it doesn't go out the way food yes. does and right. oh god <laughs> anyway that's it for this episode of today talks keep watching for more of today all day if you really want to you probably don't we don't blame no. you we get it bye <laughs> okay Freelance journalist Susan Berger never thought she'd be the story when she was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1997, or a dozen years later when genetic testing revealed she did not have the BRCA gene mutations. When you found out you didn't have the BRCA mutation, I mean, what was your first thought? I thought, great, this is my breast cancer, maybe it was just a fluke. Berger is the mother of three daughters who watched her endure a lumpectomy, chemotherapy, radiation, and years of tamoxifen to kill the cancer and keep it at bay. Or so Susan thought, until she got a frantic call from her oldest daughter, Laura, this spring. I was just like, Mom, I have this genetic mutation. I don't even understand what it is. What am I supposed to do next? I, I, don't, I don't really know. The genetic mutation was something Laura nor Susan had ever heard about. POW B2, called the third most important breast cancer gene by some experts. I've been doing health reporting for about 15 years and I read everything. I'm sort of an information sponge and I thought if I don't know, people just don't know. Doctors started testing for POW B2 in 2014, five years after Susan underwent genetic screening. Did you feel like you had been sideswiped? Yes. A POW-B2 mutation increases the risk for breast cancer by 58% with a family history, 33% with no family history. It also increases your risk for ovarian and pancreatic cancers. 42-year-old Laura, who found this mutation as part of a fertility workup, feared she was looking at the end of her life instead of bringing a new life into the world. I did think I'm going to die and I'm going to die like soon. Susan immediately started doing research, but didn't find much. I looked at my husband and I said, I have to write about this. I mean, people need to know. As she worked on her story, Susan and her other daughters got tested. Along with Laura, 69-year-old Susan has the POW-B2 mutation, as does her middle daughter, Annie. I have like three more family members who have it, and we're all, you know, in this together now. This August, the New York Times published her article on POW-B2. Day my story came out, my oncologist emailed me and said, my inbox is flooded with people saying, did you test me for POW-B2 or should I get tested for POW-B2? At New York's Mount Sinai Hospital, Chief of Breast Surgery, Dr. Alyssa Port heard the same thing. Why didn't women know about this gene? Because it is much less common and it's also associated with a somewhat lesser risk of breast cancer. Dr. Port says breast cancer patients screened before 2014 should be tested for POW-B2. If you have it, understand the odds you are facing and the actions you can take. You've gotten what amounts to an early warning system. I'm not one to sit and wait to do things, <laughs> and so I found out I had the mutation in May, and in mid-July, I had my ovaries and tubes removed. Susan also plans to have a prophylactic double mastectomy. As for her daughters, Laura and Annie, they will both be monitored closely. I feel like I've had a really good life. There's been tough times, and this is certainly one of them, but it's been okay. I always said to my kids, you know, I'm still here. Hey, I'm still here. It's really good. Now, something to keep in mind, less than 1% of all breast cancers are associated with this POW-B2 mutation. And unlike the BRCA mutation, experts see no connection between POW-B2 and any ethnic group at this point. If you have a family history of breast cancer or other cancers, you're always advised to talk with a genetic counselor. So, Anne, if someone was tested before May 2014, or maybe they're not sure what specific genes um, they were tested for, do they just call their doctor? Absolutely. It's the best thing to do. Now, testing for POW-B2 is the standard of care, okay. but it wasn't, obviously, before 2014. So if you got tested before 2014, definitely call your doctor, and the next time you see him or her, 
ask. Yeah. So, so Anne, if somebody's, if they do have this mutation, what are their options? Well, you've got a couple of options. First of all, monitoring, and that's the most important thing. They can monitor for breast, ovarian, and pancreatic cancer. And then you can have preventive surgeries, such as having your ovaries removed or a double mastectomy in the case of breast cancer. But monitoring really is the key. And thank you so much for coming in. These yeah. are the kind of stories that save lives. Or somebody's watching and then they pick up the phone and yep. call we hope their so. doctor. That's the whole right. goal. Dollars thank you. Well. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Boom. Boom. That's just shop today with Joe Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day Kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. This is fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. There's a special place in Georgia that hopes to raise awareness and funds to help fight the disease. It's a garden where hope is in full bloom and 100% of the proceeds go to breast cancer research. Take a look. It's just something about the zinnias. They're just so happy and bright. In the mountains of North Georgia, you will find zinnia happiness farms. There, Colin carefully tends to her garden. They really do make you smile. They're easy to grow and everyone is different. But there's more to these flowers than meet the eye. Each zinnia represents hope. I started Zinnia Happiness Farms about five years ago. I was in the garden cutting my zinnias and I thought about my friend Andrea Snyder, who was a florist in Atlanta, and I thought to myself, she would really love to be here right now cutting flowers with me. At 38, she got breast cancer and within three years she was gone. Colin had several loved ones who faced the disease, her sister Allison, their mother, and their grandmother. So I was thinking about these four women and what they had had to deal with. And I just had this vision to start a farm dedicated to women and men who have dealt with breast cancer and donate all the money to research. So I started charging $10 for every bouquet. Using the beauty of flowers to fight back against breast cancer. Growing up, Colin was always a giving person, always thoughtful of other people. When I got that diagnosis, I <laughs> you know, your whole world kind of closes in on you. But frankly, Colin was the first person I called and she said, you can do this and we'll get through it together. My sister sat through the 11 hours of surgery at the hospital and was at my bedside when I got home after three days and coming up January, I'll be nine years clean, so. It's stories like Allison's that bring new hope to the farm each week. I discovered it was more than just about flowers. It's just beautiful. And the more I participated, it made me appreciate my own blessings in life. It also fosters some unique friendships and fellowship while we're all together. When I first came here, I was just so overwhelmed. It's like a walking meditation through these flowers. They're great to take home and share with neighbors or fill my house. I've made new friends here. I see old friends here. I've learned a good number of these women that were showing up every week are breast cancer survivors. I was diagnosed with it 31 years ago and it's, uh, it, it's words nobody wants to hear. And to find out that you know, you're cancer free and you're just gonna go on with your life is amazing. To be able to come here, to be a part of this, is just very incredible. 
See, the, these new ones, they look a lot better. Sowing seeds of hope, Colin's efforts are a labor of love. There's tilling and weeding, lots of weeding. I have to say, I couldn't do it without my husband who runs the tractor. He's not good at weeding, but everything else he's great at. It started off pretty slow. Now we're in our fifth year, and every week I usually have eight to 12 people. It really is becoming uh, something that people like to do. Lilac? And with every new harvest, Colin believes we are closer to a cure. What I want people to know about breast cancer is that it's beatable and every year they make great strides in research and medicine. Life can change in an instant and every dollar is important. Well, I'm living proof that you can overcome this horrible disease. There's so much hope for the people who are just being diagnosed. And I do believe it will be eradicated in the future, I hope. I have a 22-year-old daughter who I pray that when she gets to her 50s that there's no more breast cancer and that's not anything she ever has to worry about. As a cancer survivor, Sunny Happiness means so much to me. It's such a message of hope and strength. It is amazing to be here and be able to give back. My hopes for Zenia Happiness is that other people are gonna get this idea. I really feel that we can all bring beauty and happiness to the world in some form or fashion. So I think Zenias are my way of bringing that happiness and beauty into the world. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Boom. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. to go through the same thing I went through. I think what I most want to convey today is that while the tragic death of a young boy to cancer may be the headline of this story, is not the headline of his story. Walker's story is about a boy who had superpowers. Nine-year-old Walker Beery had three superpowers. They were gratitude, courage, and love. Walker lived those things in a way like no one I've ever known. Two years ago, Walker was diagnosed with medulloblastoma, a pediatric brain tumor. During one of his many hospital visits, he got a gift from another sick child. A girl came into my room and just gave me a teddy bear. And my nose burned. And what that means is I was so happy, I was about to happy cry. And when that girl got out of my room, I cried for a long time. Walker's passion stemmed from a teddy bear. He realized, like, 
there's grace and goodness. And after that little gift, he, it impacted him how much impact he could also have on other people. And so he came home and his sister and he just said, we want to do a lemonade stand and, and they did it. And the next day we raised $3,500 for pediatric cancer research. At just nine years old, Walker started an organization called Kids Join the Fight. It's a big mission with a simple concept, kids helping kids. The mission was something he focused so much on, finding a cure for pediatric cancer and also caring for families that are going through this devastating disease. But the way that we did it was also really important to him. Having a little boy who was fighting for his life, but at the same time thought about others. How would you describe it? Energetic, wild, funny, so funny, but also so empathetic. He realized that he could have an impact as well. And, and it, in some ways, I think it helped him take his mind off of all the not good things he was going through, the pain, the hospital visits. Walker also learned about this unsettling statistic. Only 4% of federal government cancer research funding goes towards pediatric cancer. And that is reflected in the fact that the treatments Walker was offered were the same treatments Walker would have been offered if he got sick in 1992. We hope to play some small part in closing that gap. There's something so profoundly simple about his mission. And do you feel like that's why this has caught on? Because it's kid-led, kid-empowered, started by your little boy. Yes, it's invigorating. You know, all kids have superpowers. Kids join the fight! I have helped by doing a fundraiser with my cousins. This summer we did a car wash in Mississippi. We had jewelry, baked goods, we even had a dog washing station. And we raised about $7,000. We have raised $22,000 in total. Our team has raised about $15,000. Our goal is twenty five, dollars but we're not stopping. Wow, we're not stopping there. It's important that other kids get involved with helping this because kids are going to be like the future engineers, doctors, scientists that maybe make a cure for pediatric cancer. Before Walker lost his battle to cancer earlier this month, he had seen children from all over the country join his fight and raise nearly half a million dollars for pediatric cancer. The word legacy, when we're talking about a little boy, is kind of a strange word to, to use, but at the same time, when I read about him, I bet that he is just so happy with what's happening. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so too. You know, for our children can definitely become our heroes in a lot of ways. Our son is definitely ours. So Angel, what was the headline of your little boy's story? The headline of his story, I hope, will be this legacy. I hope that, you know, certainly too, through this foundation, we can continue to let him lead us in courage and gratitude and love. And in the words of the superhero himself, you can do really anything to raise money for cancer. Anything in the world. You just have to do something and get after it. Wow. And get after it. Don't you love that enthusiasm? And before Walker <coughs> passed away, and he, you know, he said that he wanted kids join the fight. He set this goal, okay? He said he wanted kids in each of 50 states. He wanted fundraisers in all 50 states. And guess what? Hmm. Just yesterday, they reached their goal. Oh, Isn't that just oh, great? What a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful and story. And I think if you want to help, you should. Have yeah. your kids do it. I want to get Poppy and Mila involved. Well, they, they say there's a great website. Anyway, it's on our it's on our website, hodaandjenna.com. Boy, what an inspiration. Those yeah. parents, wow. Don't you also, they're incredible, yeah. but also don't you love yeah. those three superpowers? Yeah, yeah I sure Let's do. all live by those powers. If you're a parent, you know how it is. You'd do almost anything to help your kid, to take away their pain. But what if the only way to help them is to break the law? Medical marijuana can be used by adults, an accepted treatment that is legal in 36 states. But it's not approved for use in kids, with some doctors saying it's effective, others arguing not enough research has been done. That leaves some parents in a tough spot. NBC's Katie Beck takes that on in our Sunday Spotlight. 
21-year-old Kara Zartler's life is on the move. Go to the kitchen. She lives with cerebral palsy and severe autism. Her waking hours constantly in motion. This is a pretty normal snack time. And eat and walk around. Despite the obvious challenges, Kara's parents, Mark and Christy Zartler, say their daughter is living her best life. There's Kara. Hello, girl. Functioning better and feeling happier than many painful years of her childhood. They say medical marijuana dramatically improved her life and theirs. She has self-injurious behavior of where she'll punch, you know, her face uh, for extended periods of time. Before cannabis treatments, the fits, as her parents call them, captured here in the 2020 documentary Weediatrics, happened thousands of times a day. Doctor prescribed medicines didn't help and added horrible side effects. Desperate for a solution, the Zartlers tried marijuana. You saw the symptoms stop just like that. Mm -hmm. And we still do. There's no medicine in our medicine cabinet that's like even close. Today, Kara's fits are rare, and a cannabis vapor treatment can end an episode in about 15 minutes. Hey, Kara. Her whole body demeanor was just so relaxed, and she would look me in the eye, and I thought, this is not, this is a different person. It was a miracle. I'm sorry. Their miracle is also illegal. In Texas, where they live, Kara's effective dosage of marijuana is a felony. And prescriptions in most states can be hard to come by, since the American Academy of Pediatrics hasn't endorsed using marijuana to treat autism. Why not just give the, the, the stamp of approval for parents to try it? But there's really a lack of research on it. What we want to know is, is it safe and is it effective? We don't really have any data on either of those things. Pediatrician Dr. Bonnie Goldstein has used cannabis to treat autistic patients in California since 2013. How much of this is about getting over the societal stigma of using marijuana? I think a lot of it uh, has to do with the brainwashing and all the propaganda that, that cannabis is bad. Just getting to a neutral place is difficult. But again, I say let the science lead the way. Adding about 75% of her patients have seen positive life-changing results without side effects. Families facing similar despair often reach out to the Zartlers. The couple shares what's perhaps the best reward of their journey. When she can look me in the eye and when she can smile, it's, it feels, if my heart just beats and it feels wonderful. For Sunday Today, Katie Beck, Dallas, Texas. Our thanks to Katie Beck for that one. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. Shop today with Joe Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day Kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All right, it just is. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. A lot of us likely know the feeling of having a passion that you don't get to pursue, but sometimes life throws you a curveball and suddenly what's really important comes right into focus. Oh, don't you love that? And that's exactly what happened to one father who's sharing his uplifting story with Donna. Yes, his name is Norman Greenstein. And after receiving an unexpected diagnosis, Norman's perspective shifted and he saw the opportunity to fulfill a dream he never thought possible. 
This is my Picasso Matisse. While Norman Greenstein's active lifestyle brought him to many landscapes, painting one was not in his initial plan. When I was 18, 19 years old, I just wanted to travel, but I didn't have money, so I joined the Air Force. He'd always been drawn to art, but was discouraged from pursuing it. For years, my notebooks from high school had doodles on them, so I was a doodler. A friend of mine got me an appointment with the dean of the art school, and I showed him my work, and he said to me, the problem with modern art is you could spit on a canvas and call it art. That's what he thought of my art. So uh, I didn't do it. He put his dream aside and went about building a life. He married Phyllis in 1971, and they raised their children, Michelle, Gabe, and Stephen, in several cities across the United States and Israel, as Norm made a living as a social worker and Jewish community leader. Gabe, how would you describe your dad growing up? He was wonderful, and he always took care of our family. And I knew he wanted to be an artist his whole life. And I knew he had always put that on the back burner. Norm's life was full of activity and travel, but in 2008, a small twitch in his leg signaled big changes to come. I had a neurologist. He took one look at me. He said, you have Parkinson's disease. Initially, you know, we were, we were devastated, very concerned. When I was first diagnosed, my wife was my coach for the first couple years, and then she developed brain cancer, and she's in remission now. But from being my coach, I became her coach. I didn't have time to sit around and feel sorry for myself. I only had Parkinson's disease. It could be worse. It was at this point in 2013, during a hike with his son Gabe, that Norm opened himself back up to the possibility of art in his life. Where did this desire to start painting come from? I actually remember Gabe and I had a discussion on Crystal Mountain about art. And I really felt inspired by our conversation. Then I started painting. And he's been painting ever since, taking classes at a community college, producing hundreds of pieces, and having his art featured in local galleries. How does it feel to see your paintings hanging in galleries now? It's wonderful. And they treated me not as someone with Parkinson's, they treated me as an artist. It felt very good. My painting helped me because it gave me a focus. Before I was working, so I was busy with work, but now I'm busy with art. So being busy keeps you healthy. Keeping busy has included writing a book with his family about his painting. The title, Spit on a Canvas, The Journey of the Parkinson's Painter, a reference to his doubtful dean. So I learned more about my dad from this whole process than I had actually really known him for the, for the early parts of my life. As a kid, I was just so stunned by how prolific of an artist and talented of an artist he became. And his excuse for that is he's painting on borrowed time. And portions of the proceeds from his paintings and book are donated to various Parkinson's research foundations. I knew my dad was a good guy my whole life, but I'm just so amazed and impressed to be his son and to be able to be a part of helping him in this journey. Stephen, Gabe, how has your life changed since your dad's diagnosis? Stephen has kind of put his life on pause to live with my parents and to take care of them. When I was younger, they obviously, they took care of me all the time. Now I feel like I can pay them back somehow by helping to take care of them. Seeing my family working together, you know, I have a wonderful family and I have a good life. What is your message to everyone watching? Don't give up. Don't give up. If you are lucky enough to get some recognition, try to do some good with it. It was so lovely talking to Norm and his two sons. He told me he hopes his story will help inspire others, which it certainly is. And ultimately, he wants his book to help play a part in fu funding a cure for Parkinson's. Oh, how beautiful is that? And it's like, it shows was, you it's never too late to follow gorgeous, your dreams, gorgeous. Donna. Thank you, thank you.
<laughs> Have you ever heard that before? Not from you. <laughs> How are you? Good, nice to see you. I mean, this day and this garden are just for you. How beautiful is it up here? Incredible. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me on. Let's talk Legos. Legos. <laughs> Legos. <laughs> Was that hello, like, sounded deep enough for it to be belly and button talk or not really? You have to kind of bring it down from here. Okay. You have to hello. go. Hello. No, no, no. Not <laughs> your hand. Hello. hello. And then you go up high. Oh, okay. You start low and go hello. high. Hello. Yeah. No. No. Hey. Hello. Hello. <laughs> What's that? Oh, it's just a stupid thing. Well, I'm sure it's stupid. <laughs> about me, is it? No. Not at all. No, me. All right. You know this girl, Claire, I'm seeing? Yeah. Well, he and I started joking that when she falls asleep, her stomach stays awake all night and talks to me. How's it talking? Well, the belly button's like a mouth. I'm bored. OK, so you've played a lot of different Jerry's. Do you know what I mean? You've had the big puffy sleeve Jerry. Yes, I, on the Today Show. Yes. We debuted the puffy shirt on the Today Show with Brian Gumble. That is a very, very unusual shirt you have on. You know, yeah. They're all kind of, kind of puffed up. Yeah, it's a puffy shirt. <laughs> you look kind of like a pirate. <laughs> yeah, like a pirate. Anyway, uh, you know, we're hoping to um, raise enough money with the you know, you know, with this. Look, I'm sorry. It is just a very unusual shirt. It could be kind of a whole new look for you. You know, you could put a, a patch over an eye. You could kind of like be the pirate comedian. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You've yeah. had some iconic looks. Yeah. What made you think, okay, it's time naturally to be a Lego Jerry? Well, who doesn't want to be a Lego? It's Lego Seinfeld. He's blocky, he's stoppy, he has sea hands. What are we selling here? <laughs> Lego, the reason people love Lego is because they, it clicks together. And once it clicks, it fits, it's tight, and it makes sense. Yes. And the world doesn't make sense, but Lego, you can, you can order the universe with Lego. You can make sense of something. Yeah. If you follow the instructions and you complete the model, it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I have three little kids. Have you ever stepped on a Lego in the middle of the night? It's painful, yeah. It's not a great thing. You're no. right that they make sense. There's there's moments where you want to throw them, though. Yeah. Does that, is fun that, to throw, too. Is that sort of makes is that sort of you? You know, they're, they're like, Jerry, you make sense, but there's moments where you're like, no, that I've work. never stepped on a Lego, <laughs> but it does seem like a killer. Okay. In this short, you say, but I don't want to be a Lego. <laughs> right. But you actually wanted to be a Lego. You, this was I your did, idea. Yeah. How, what was the genesis? Uh, the genesis was Lego made a model of my TV show set, and Netflix bought the TV show and wanted to do a promo, and I went, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> Why can't I be a Lego? <laughs> and, then I, and then I really wanted to do the line again. I don't want to be a pirate. But I, yeah, but I don't want to be a Lego. But I don't want to be a Lego. I know. I, somehow that that is a hard octave to match. You know, there's a whininess to that that's really hard to do. It's it, these are some of the little subtle things of comedy that are very important. So, what did your wife and kids think when you told them you were turning into? They loved it. I got the idea from my son, who was wanted to build his last Lego. He's 16. He thinks he said, you know, I think I got one more Lego <laughs> left in me. One more. I go, why don't you do the set from my TV show. We were walking along and I went, oh, that's the promo. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make Netflix shrink me down. <laughs> shrink you down and pour actual Lego cereal yes. into your mouth. There, you, the set is incredible. It's exactly it's like your amazing. set. amazing. Tell me some of the details you love. I, I love the couch and I love the refrigerator and the stove. And I love wearing the costume. Some of those bits, like, you know, when I skate out in the yes. end, that took an hour and a half oh. of moving an inch at a time. And when I sit down on the couch, that took an hour and a half. The stop motion is not done with humans. Yeah. It's done with props. You know, the last person to do it was Peter Gabriel Sledgehammer. Oh, really? Yes. Humans don't do stop motion. We do it with toys and props. <laughs> you don't ask a person to do this. And now this. 
And now this, you know. But the fact that, so first of all, somebody told me about this and I thought like, no, no, he, Jerry Seinfeld's not becoming a Lego. Yeah. <laughs> and then they told me you shot it last week. Yeah, last week. So how much fun was it? There was a lot of laughter. It was insane. <laughs> we, it was just this crazy, everybody. We had to hire an animation company to do the stop motion because I wanted it to be stop motion. And then to build that set, it was all custom made out of foam and then paint and then the plastic finish to make it shiny. I mean, we worked so hard on it. It was so much fun. I bet it was. Yeah. So the amazing Brian Cranston, who is a Tony winner, an Emmy winner, yeah. Oscar nominated. Yeah. You call him on the phone and you're like, hey, you want to be a Lego? He's not a well, Lego. Well, he's an announcer. He's an announcer. Coming this fall to Netflix. 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 Net ne 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 Seinfeld. 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 You call him on the phone and say, want to be in a Lego short? Yeah. And his response was? Love to. He says, I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> but I trust you. That's what he said. Did you notice the little dentist chair at the end? I sure did. That's Was the that little, a nod uh, to him? I think that's a cookie, what we call a cookie. <laughs> okay, I thought maybe that would have been a stranger conversation, but it was just pretty basic. Want to be in a Lego short? Let's if, do it. If you're a comedy person, which Brian is, even though he's done a lot of yes. drama, and someone gives you a crazy idea, you go, yeah, that sounds crazy. People really don't know what's going to happen. Really a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. <laughs> There is some late breaking news for hours in the Iowa caucuses. All right, it just did too. News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're gonna do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening, with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life. In primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. So the last couple years, people have been at home on their couches. Right. Is this, is there like a lot of creativity spurring up in you? Is that why things like this are happening or not really? Maybe. I didn't think about that, but maybe. I, I personally have a, a feel like I really need to have some fun. I really need to make fun things for people. Yeah. That's why I wanted to do this. I go, this is just fun and silly. And I don't see enough of that. Yeah. I like that. It, does, it will make people laugh for yeah. sure. So Netflix has picked up all of these episodes. Yes. Do you think the world's ready? I don't know. <laughs> They weren't when we started back in 89, that's for sure. It took a number of years before people said, what are, what are they talking about? How do they talk? I know, that's kind of interesting. So it didn't catch on right away? No, it took four years. The first four years of the show, it was poorly received, very poorly received. That's forgotten now. Yeah. Yeah. But And so how did you all have the patience just to wait it through? Well, um, in those days, on television, if you got a good demo, yeah. uh, the advertisers wanted to be on your show. So even though we were not good, <laughs> we got a certain audience that was buying like BMWs. So that kept us on the air. Um, I, tell me about being a Lego, the, transforming. It did not look comfortable, I have to tell you. It was okay. I, I was fine with it. I just wanted to be it so bad. I want to be in the toy. Seems like, you know, so if, you bought, if you bought that toy, yeah. 
and you could get me shrunk yes. down in it. Wouldn't that be the ultimate? I'd be very into having you as a Lego, <laughs> but I have to tell you, I, I was worried about you because it looked like oh. there was a little bit of a wedgie in this area. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah there's lots of. Just between you and me, we want, there was a there a little issues, wedgie? A lot of issues below the waist. It looks yeah. like it. Yeah. I mean, that, that round area, you yeah. know what I mean? Uh-huh. <laughs> Okay. Um, I loved Netflix's press release. It was brilliant. Did you read it? The new show thing? Yeah. Yeah. It said Netflix will launch 180 episodes of a situational comedy called Seinfeld, created by rising New York comedian Jerry Seinfeld and Larry David, who wrote for Saturday Night Live for a single season. That's right. So how did you feel about, I mean, the fact that they would take a chance on a young New Yorker just like you, did that feel good? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did. And to make that many shows, not knowing. If anyone was going to like it, it was quite a gamble. It really was. Yeah. Thank you, Netflix. Yeah. Sitting here with this beautiful view in Rockefeller Center, New York's been through a lot. Yes. You wrote a really beautiful article that I feel like everybody posted online. And um, what does it feel like to be here on this day, beautiful fall day in a city that you love so much? I am uh, humbly uh, proud of uh, that I stuck up for my town. Yeah. I, I just love this town. And, you know, I, I know, I grew up you know, all around here, so you, you know the people, you know what they're made of. You know, you, you're, not, you're not getting rid of this. There is nothing like this anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. There's a resilience. To yes, it, right? yes. And on a day like this, there's nowhere better to be. No, no, it has a, New York on a beautiful day is really magical. It really is. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I'm just wondering, as a Lego, could could Elaine do her dance? Like, what would that look like? There'd be like? a lot of clicking and yeah. clacking. Kind yeah. of like in, in the knee area? Yeah, the, some of the plastic might crack. Now, does a Lego have a belly button? No. No, so, just I mean, shirt buttons. How would you talk from your belly button? That'd be a really hard thing. Well, we're not going to do the whole series. <laughs> I, have, okay, I have to not. tell you the truth. <laughs> It was really just a joke. Oh, you're not do I no. thought you were doing the whole series as a Lego. Yeah, that's kind of uh, the way it looks, but no, we couldn't do it. <laughs> Too expensive, right? Yeah, yeah. These days. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. I forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. Then fun, bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. Yes, yes, yes. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All right, it just seems. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, oh. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. I forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. Then fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The biggest grievance of 2021 so far. And you don't have to have one if you don't want one. But oh, do I've got one? tons. <laughs> um, sounds like a plan. That's because it is a plan. That's what the sound was. Just tell me what time you want to meet. Stop saying the thing sounds like a plan. <laughs> you know what? Actually, Hoda and I, are, and, and actually Savannah, we're in a fight over the word literally. 
because we think oh, it's overused. Way overused. Are you on my side? Totally. They're like, totally well, literally, go too, it's, by literally it's freezing out here. I'm yeah. like, no, it's just cold. It's just freezing. If it was literally freezing, yeah. you would have frostbite. That's right. Okay, so you want to tell Hoda that you're on my side? I'm on Jenna's side, Hoda. Stop with the literally. Thank you. It's not a book <laughs> to begin with. Yeah, if we want to talk literal, yeah. let's go to talk Jane Austen. You yeah. know what I mean? You go away from New York for a couple of months. What's the first thing you do when you come back? Just walk. A walk in New York is like reading a novel. The, you see snippets of, you know what I love? That people yap on the phone out loud. <laughs> I love hearing half a conversation. I you do know? too. I, it's fun, right? I yeah. don't find it annoying. No, I, really I don't like find it. it annoying. In fact, when we go to restaurants, I'm like, honey, they're getting divorced. He's like, can you pay attention to me? Yeah. It's hard not to. Musical artist that you listen to that would surprise some people. Do you like music? I love music. That would surprise some people. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it would surprise them. I really love John Denver. That's not a surprise. I, I love uh, America. I love the band America. I, and I really love uh, Malo, who they had a song called Suavecito, which is my favorite song. <laughs> is it really? Suavecito. Can you sing a little bit of Suavecito mm. to me? La, 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 <laughs> la, la, la. Sound familiar? No. You know this song, Jenna, you know Suavecito? this song. Suavecito? You know Suavecito. You don't know that you know it. It's one of the greatest Latin Suavecito. Song. Yeah. Is that it? No. I'm thinking Despes Despacito. It's not Despacito. Do you know Despacito by yes. the Bieber? Despacito no, no. es Suavecito. <laughs> okay. okay. It's um, diferente. So I felt like I needed to say, hello. Is that better? Right. No. Is it what? Was that better? Hello. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Is that, what's the number one Seinfeld line that people yell at you when you're walking the streets? Um, they yell, um, Where's Kramer a lot? I don't know why I'm expected to be with him at all times. They yell, where's Kramer? What do you say? I go, he's not real. <laughs> he's not real. Um, uh, this is sort of a strange one, but last picture you took on your iPhone. I hope, it, it, only if it's, in a, if it's not appropriate. It's always, of course, I don't do anything okay. not appropriate. Okay, the last picture I took, well, it's a, it's a small story. Okay, we've got the time, as long okay. as you do. I like, I like, uh, I watch a lot of YouTube. I like funny uh, pet stuff. Yeah, and I, saw I know you do. I saw a bulldog <laughs> riding a skateboard. Uh, and it was so cute, and I was so fascinated. And I just thought, that they just showed how this bulldog, he just loves his skateboard, he loves it. And I go, that, that's, that explains so much of life right there. He just, he just loves it. There's no reason why. No one will ever understand why. He loves that skateboard. So later on that day, I was walking from 69th in New York to Columbus and 81st. And as I was getting up to Columbus on 81st, I saw a bulldog no. and a woman, same day, a woman carrying his skateboard. Was it the same bulldog? No. And did you take a picture yes. of it? Yes. And did you send it to your wife? No. Okay. I thought maybe you'd share it. I know she likes funny pet I videos, I told the too. story. The picture wasn't great. <laughs> a little blurry. Yeah, but it was amazing. So I just have to go back to the fact that you like funny pet videos. Do you find comfort in them, humor? What is it? I don't, uh, I don't really have a pet. I don't I know. You we, do have a pet. I you know, have Javier. It's, I'm, I'm not, it's not, he and I have no real relationship. Wait, that's, your wife is going to take real offense to this. No, it's her thing. You don't like cats? They're okay. <laughs> but Javier is marrying my sister's cat. That's fine. You're not going to be at the wedding? I guess I will. <laughs> you don't really like a cat. I, I like that my wife enjoys it. Okay. And when he gets lost, I go looking for him. Well, that, Javier does not go outside on the streets of New York, does he? No, but out, we have a house on Long okay. Island and sometimes he will escape. Okay, well that's nice. So you yeah. do secretly love the cat? 
Okay, secretly. Okay, I thought Let's so. keep it a secret. All right, don't tell anybody. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're going to do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening, with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life. In primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. High forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. Then fun, bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Excuse me, I, I think you forgot my bread. Bread, two dollars extra. Two dollars, but everyone in front of me got free bread. You want bread? Yes, please. Three dollars! <laughs> what? No soup for you! You want bread? Three dollars! No soup for you! How would I describe the soup Nazi? Is I just thought he was a very militant food vendor who who didn't take crap from anybody and uh, ruled his his soup station with an iron fist and I I even went into the original audition in an army uniform with a beret so I looked like uh, Saddam Hussein <laughs> you're pushing your luck little man Sheila hey uh oh what is this you're kissing in my line nobody kisses in my line my favorite line is the kissing line, and uh, I was doing a, a thing for Sony once called the Seinfeld Food Truck, where we were going to different locations, and for two hours people would line up and get treats. And uh, I very seldom get the chance to say that line, and there was one couple in Albuquerque, New Mexico, who were brave enough to stand there and start making out in front of me, and I finally got to say, like, you're kissing in my line? Nobody kisses in my line! The main thing is to keep the line moving. I say, you hold out your money, speak your soup in a loud, clear voice, step to the left and receive. So, right. The step to the left part, it, it's, it's been made fun of so often. I've had people come up to me and like stand like that and step to the left. And uh, going to the actual real soup stand, I finally found out that the reason you step to the left is the menu board is to your right. So if you order and stay there, no one else could see the menu. So there actually is method to the madness. I actually say no soup for you a lot these days, but uh, in the first like three years after the episode, I refused to say it. I wouldn't say it for anybody. I, had, when I was nominated for the Emmy, I had interviews with a, a few big TV shows and I refused to say it for them because I just thought I'd sound like a bad water cooler impression of myself out of context. And then when we shot the finale, um, the very first scene we shot was actually a silent scene at this bed and breakfast where I take Poppy's soup bowl away from him because he motions that he wants salt and pepper. <laughs> and uh, Jerry and Larry David decided that I should say No Soup For You out loud, even though you weren't going to hear it in the show, which absolutely terrorized me but I said it and as we walked away from that scene Larry David walked over to me and goes hey man you say it the same way you said it three years ago so ever since then it's like a knee jerk there was um, a lady named Marcia who was in the extra pool and they had built the soup stand a little longer than they planned so for me to go to the cash register and back to serve the soup was killing the timing of the lines. It was just taking too long. So they called this girl out from the extra pool because she looked like she would be working in, in my stand. And uh, her name was Marcia. And 
She, at a moment's notice, did that thing where she pulls the bag away from George and hands him the money back. It actually got uh, more laughs than anything I did. And to this day, when I see that scene over and over again, I laugh at her timing. The guy who runs the place is a little temperamental, especially about the ordering procedure. He's secretly referred to as the soup Nazi. <laughs> Working with that cast was just amazing. Jason Alexander was calling me Lat, which is the New York shortening of Larry. There's Lawrence, Larry, Lat, but that's New York. And he was calling me that within about an hour of me being on the set. Um, Julia was incredible because if I made her laugh, she would totally break up and she'd grab my hand and go, you're so funny. So they were so welcoming. But the most amazing story to me is Jerry himself because um, I've dealt with a lot of producers and directors in the world of theater, TV, film, everything. I've done some directing myself and I know what that's like. But I've never worked with um, a, a director and producer who had less ego than Jerry Seinfeld. Medium crab bisque. When I did the callback, I did the six scenes that the Soup Nazi has, and he laughed a lot. It was great. It was, he was laughing too much, actually. And then he had me do it again, and he said, you know, I don't understand why the character is so mean. Could you, you know, kind of do it again and give it some of this, be a little nicer sometimes, which I did horribly. I don't think he laughed once. And I thought for sure that was, you know, the death nail about the character. I wasn't going to get it. But I did get it, and as soon as I walked onto the soundstage, Jerry B. lined over to me and he said, you know what, man, forget about the direction I gave you, just do what you did when you walked in. The meaner, the funnier, I guess. And I was just astounded by his lack of wanting to be right, which almost every other director and producer uh, has. I could go a long time without being recognized, but every once in a while, somebody will say to me, you know, has anybody ever told you you look like the soup Nazi from Seinfeld? And depending on if I have time to talk about it, you know, because sometimes I, like I'm in a rush or something, so I'll just say like, yeah, I get that a lot. And other times, you know, I, I get to go like, yeah, I was him. You know, and it's, it's always fun because Seinfeld fans uh, range from 13 years old to, to 83 years old, you know. A couple of times I've been somewhere, like on the subway, or somewhere where it's crowded and people can't really see me. And I will actually hear somebody say to somebody else, you know, no soup for you. And I'm, I'm actually like, you know, 10 people away and they don't even know that I'm there, but I hear people say it. I actually wrote a book called Confessions of a Soup Nazi, an adventure in acting and cooking, uh, which is part cookbook, part memoirs of, you know, 30, 40 years of being an actor. But the reason I wrote it is because I get so many people that come up to me and they go, you know, you were so great on Seinfeld. Did you ever do any other acting after that? So, uh, I, but I get all kinds of stuff. I get people that, that think I'm really Al Yegane and that's, you know, I, I was at your soup stand. I visited New York and I was at your soup stand and, you know, it was closed. When do you plan on reopening? I have so much fun with going, like, I'm, I'm an actor, it's not my soup stand, it's, you know. The funniest thing about how my life has changed after Seinfeld is I had no idea that the life I had was gone forever. Not a moment goes by in my life where it doesn't have something to do with having been the soup Nazi. Really, an hour goes by and something happens where that takes over my life again. So it's, it's a whole new existence. Where do I think the Soup Nazi would be now? Well, then I have to pitch my idea for a spinoff because, see, I, I see a food court in Manhattan where the Soup Nazi, Babu, and Poppy are all in a row with their prospective little stands, and Jackie Childs comes in there every day for lunch and we vie for his business, of course. You know, whatever the storylines are about, uh, or whatever actually the events that happen in every episode, it really boils down to the way people treat each other. You know, they didn't treat people very well. You gotta admit that. I know 
People loved, you know, Jerry, George, Elaine, and Kramer, but they were horrible. They treated people badly, and they always got their comeuppance for treating people badly. So I guess in the end, that's such a generational and universal, never-ending idea is you treat people a certain way and you get back the way, you know, it's like the golden rule, you know, you get back what you give. And that's really what the show is about in the end. This is Cooking Up a Storm. I'm Al Roker. Today, we are turning to one of the most revered chefs of our time to tackle one of the most popular side dishes of the Thanksgiving meal. Joining us, the one, the only, Ina Garten, known to a lot of folks as the Barefoot Contessa. She's so incredibly popular, mainly because she makes great cooking accessible for so many of us. From her popular Food Network show, Barefoot Contessa, to her, I think, 300 cookbooks, <laughs> Uh, Ina reminds us all that being a good cook is within our reach, especially if you follow her recipes. Today, we're going to hone in on a recipe of hers that truly shines, her Parmesan smashed potatoes. Ina, thanks for joining us on the podcast. I'm very flattered. And actually, this recipe is from my first book, The, the Barefoot Contessa Cookbook. Really? It really is. Is Thanksgiving your favorite holiday? Absolutely. Why? It's just a meal, unlike Christmas, which has so much going on. Yeah. It's just your favorite people are invited for dinner, and everything is absolutely delicious. It's old-fashioned, but kind mm. of updated in a nice way, the way that, you know, it's mashed potatoes, but they're done a little better than you expect them to be. When they were coming up with the ideas for what recipes we could get, uh, they said, what, what's some of your favorites? And after I rattled off a bunch, uh, one of my producers said, what, what, what about mashed potatoes? I'm not a big fan of the mashed potato uh, because I'm sure you've tried a, a number of things. You've probably not had great mashed potatoes in your time. Well, I just think the key to mashed potatoes is what you add to them mm -hmm. to make them have great flavor. So it's about the flavor, the texture, and I think some two things people really miss a lot in, in almost every recipe is the salt. It needs a lot of salt to give it flavor, mm -hmm. but also it needs something with an edge. Very often it's like lemon zest or something like that. In this one, it's Parmesan cheese. Oh. It's something that's a little sharp that mm -hmm. kind of wakes up your taste buds. But usually mashed potatoes is potatoes, cream, butter, yeah. and not enough salt, and it's boring. So the Parmesan smashed potatoes have texture, they have flavor, the sour cream has kind of a, you know, a tangy edge mm -hmm. to it. So it's really what you bring to it that makes all the difference. In a sense, it seems to me that this recipe is actually easier than oh, mashed potatoes. so much easier. Because first, you don't have to peel them. Mm -hmm. um, second, they cook very quickly because they're small potatoes. And, um, and then you just mix them in a, in a mixer, which is as easy as it gets. When I'm thinking about a recipe, I always have an exact thing in my head, what I'm looking for, and I just keep going until I get there. If mm -hmm. I don't have something that I'm going for, it never ends. I just never, I never get there. So you could actually cut up other potatoes. You could take Yukon Gold potatoes, which have a very creamy texture. I wouldn't peel them, and I, but I would cut them in, in small sizes. So, you know, like a large dice. And so they cook really quickly. Mm -hmm. And then you drain them and put them in the mixer and add everything else. You kind of ad lib about this and you kind of play with it until you get it right. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems like, to me, cooking lends itself more to that than baking. That would be harder to ad-lib baking. Absolutely, because baking, you put everything in a, in a pan, you put it in the oven, and you hope it's going to work. But cooking, you can kind of add something here, add something there, um, kind of play around with it along the way. For mm, any recipe, what I'm doing is I'm taking the intrinsic ingredients and figuring out how to make them taste better. Mm, it's delicious. A little more salt. I always needs a little more. Um, mm. And more like themselves, the actually. The so my favorite sweet potato recipe is I peel, I, I actually bake sweet potatoes, scoop them out, put them also in the mixer, and add butter and um, chipotle powder mm -hmm. and maple oh. syrup. So they're sweet and spicy. And I think they really complement the sweet potatoes, mm -hmm. which are totally different. So Chipotle you know, smashed sweet potatoes is what they are. They're, sma they're the smashed smash sweet too. potato. Because it's got texture. I love that. Yeah, they're pretty good. I love to make, um, instead of stuffing for the turkey, I make um, a savory bread pudding, huh. which instead of kind of, you know, kind of like wet and, I mean, stuffing's delicious. Yes. But when you make a bread pudding instead, it's creamy on the bottom and crispy on the top, so it's got more texture. 
And so I make a, um, a leek and mushroom bread pudding mm. or a, um, an apple and herb bread pudding. So it's got lots of flavors and textures, mm. and it just goes with everything else. Here's my thing on the stuffing. <clears throat> yeah. And, I, and I, again, the, uh, I'm going to talk to Alexander Smalls. Uh, he's making oyster dressing. Uh, he's from the South. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the North. I grew up in New York City. We always called it stuffing. I, and I was like, what is this dressing that people speak of? I don't know. I think it's the same thing. Yeah, I, I think it's just what they refer to it. I think a Southern expression is, is dressing, mm -hmm. and in the North we call it stuffing. And, and see, to me, I could do without the turkey, except <laughs> for I like the turkey to make the stuffing in, but I also do an, a, another big batch of it, like bake it in the oven, and then mix the two. So oh, that that's they're a little wet and dry, and by the time you average it out, it should be the right consistency. The reason why I prefer not to stuff the turkey is because in order to get the, the stuffing cooked, mm -hmm. I feel like you have to overcook the turkey. Right. So if the heat can get into the middle, and I do it the way I do a chicken, uh, like a chicken with herbs and lemon and garlic in the, in the cavity, mm -hmm. um, the turkey will cook in like two or two and a half hours. Oh. And so the turkey is really moist. If right. you stuff it, in order to get the stuffing cooked all the way through, and you need to do that mm -hmm. to be safe, um, I feel like the turkey's overcooked. Right. So that's why I like to do the stuffing separately as a bread pudding. I've never heard of anybody dying from... From stuffing. <laughs> I, I, I'm, and they, maybe they did, and the, and the coroner they just didn't, didn't, didn't want to put down death due to stuffing. Because that would, Overstuffed? Yeah. Very good. <laughs> that was very a... good. Yes. And that's why I'm a garden lady, queen, ladies and gentlemen, the queen of cooking. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's, Let's go. go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Oh. Oh. What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove, because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back! News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're gonna do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening, with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life. In primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at seven on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. You've hosted Thanksgiving dinners. What's the one thing that, as host, you need to be cognizant of uh, when it comes to your dinner? I think particularly for Thanksgiving, but for every dinner, what everybody likes to eat. Because, you know, you've invited people you love. You want to make sure they all have something they love to eat. Sure. So I just think it's, it's important to just make sure everybody's well taken care of without them feeling singled out mm -hmm. as like, this is the meal for all of us, and that's, that's right. what you're going to have. Yeah. And so I think that's really true for any dinner, but particularly Thanksgiving. Especially if you're the host. Yeah, because, I mean, I only invite people I love. I want them to be happy. How do we time it out so that everything comes out 
at the right time together. I literally do when I should start making something and when it should go into the oven, when it should come out. And then I know that everything's done at 7.30 when everybody arrives. So, and Thanksgiving is actually um, a good one to do because you can make the turkey early. You can make the vegetables very often in advance to reheat. Uh, and while the turkey's resting, which is about a half an hour, everything goes back in the oven and reheat, uh-huh. to be reheated. So there's, there's a timing thing that works really well. And then everything goes on the, on the table. I like buffet style mm-hmm. because I think then everybody gets up and gets what they like and they can pass up what they don't like yeah. and then they can come back and they can go have seconds and it's no big deal. I can't imagine this would have happened to you, but have you had anything go wrong Me? at Thanksgiving? Something go wrong? Yeah. Never happens. No? No. But I know about other people that have things have gone wrong. <laughs> <laughs> actually, a friend of mine, I had done, actually, the last wedding that I ever catered, um, was hers, and um, it was in, a, in, in like October. Mm-hmm. And she called me in November and said, "You know, I I, I want to make a Thanksgiving dinner for my new husband, but um, I just I don't know, I've never cooked like that." So I said to her, "Okay, so this is what you do: think of a turkey as like a large chicken. So <laughs> you're going to cook it the same way you cook a chicken, just for a little longer." So I showed her, uh, told her exactly how to make it, and she put the turkey in the oven and she said to her and her husband let's go for a walk it's going to be an hour and then I'll come back and baste it and she came back and couldn't open the oven door and it turns out she had set the oven on clean oh no not on not on the temperature I told her to set it on so her husband had to un I actually literally unscrew the oven door to get the turkey out. And I was like, what did you do? And she said, well, I served it. She said, it was very clean. <laughs> <laughs> so I think everybody has a Thanksgiving disaster story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, but, you know, you just get through it and you do, do the best you can. When did you realize you had that knack, that certain something that, you know, to, to entertain, to, to nourish people, to, to give them something besides a plain meal, that that there was something else attached to it. Well, you know, when I was growing up, I wasn't allowed to cook. Wait, what? I wasn't allowed to cook. I wasn't allowed in the kitchen. Why? I don't know. I think my mother just wanted me in my room, and she wanted the kitchen to herself. And so she said, it's your job to to study. It's my job to cook and just get out of the kitchen. So I kind of always wanted to do it. And I got married when I was 20. And I think that's when I started to think this is what I'd like to, I love cooking. I taught myself how to cook with, as, as you know, the Craig Claiborne's Mastering, no, Craig Claiborne's um, New York Times cookbook, and then later Julia Child's Mastering the Art of French Cooking. And I just started, you know, I was always working. When I was working in Washington, I'd come home at night and cook, and I just loved it. And at some point I thought, I want to do this for my work, not just for fun. I think what I was craving as a child is connecting with people. And I felt that if you feed them, they always show up and you have a good time together. And that was the connection I loved. So I kept doing it over and over again. So dinner's over. You got, you know, Tupperware containers of stuff and foil wrapped packages in your in your fridge. What do you like to do Thanksgiving leftover was? Well, actually, I have a thing about Thanksgiving leftovers. I think the guests want to have leftovers, too. Ah. So, I mean, I've literally on occasion done a second Thanksgiving dinner where mm-hmm. they have a whole turkey to take home and extra stuffing and extra... Because everybody wants sandwiches the next sure. day, right? So that And actually, one year, we all decided we were going to... Ma- I was going to make Thanksgiving dinner the day before, and we were going to have... Thanksgiving dinner was going to be actually turkey sandwiches <laughs> which was really fun <laughs> so so where do you stand on the turkey sandwich uh leftover construction uh, w- w- what's the best way to maximize you mean this, this is the flavor profile of yes. the turkey, turkey sandwich yes good question i don't think i've ever really studied that i just put everything on the table and everybody makes their own sandwiches uh-huh. so what's your what's your fr- well, flavor profile i i like uh, uh i start with a, a good crusty bread yeah uh mayo the turkey, some stuffing, yeah, some cranberry sauce. Exactly, it's just what I would. A little do. more mayo, yeah, and then cut it. That sounds great. Yes, that sounds really good. A little sweet, a little every, salty. Every once in a while, I like a little um, uh, chipotle smashed sweet potatoes in there. Ooh, that might be good, right? Ooh, you know, somebody came on the show, and I think using leftover mash, uh, uh, sweet potatoes, uh, made waffles. Oh, just, I could see that. Yeah, just That's a put great the idea. waffles yeah. in the waffle iron, closed it up. Jeffrey, hey, look, it's no secret. The, the two of you are, uh, I mean, uh, you, you guys are what 
I think all of us try to aspire to. Well, uh, and that's not thanks, to say bro. that you 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 know you guys have a perfect marriage. You like that's you're human. Great. You're human, <laughs> but you have, great. you have a great marriage. It's pretty great. I'm sure people ask you what's the secret. You know, <laughs> Nora Ephron used to say when people asked her about her um, marriage, she'd say it's three words. She she'd say marry an Italian, <laughs> and I would say it's two words: marry Jeffrey. I mean, he's just a sweetheart. He's mm-hmm. just a kind, funny, smart, um, generous. Uh, he just wants me to be happy. And I want the same thing for him. It's really not complicated. And yet you say he's not your best sounding board when it comes to food. <laughs> if I ask him if he likes something, he always says, this is the most delicious thing you've ever made. So <laughs> I don't trust his taste. <laughs> but uh, as a husband, he's perfect. <laughs> there you go. So, so do you guys have, uh, uh, what, what are your Thanksgiving traditions? Um, it, you know, so for a long time, there was a family we were very close to, and, and they, I would invite them and the kids and the grandkids, and we would all have a wonderful time. But because of COVID, we couldn't do that anymore. And so um, it was, you know, it's just the two of us mm-hmm. or some close friends that were in a pod with us. Um, but we keep it, I mean, I kind of like a nice Thanksgiving for two, frankly. Mm-hmm. When, when Jeffrey and I lived in Washington in the 70s, um, and, you know, we had to work on Friday, we couldn't go home to our families. His family lived in Florida. My family lived in Connecticut. Couldn't go home for a day. So we would have Thanksgiving just to ourselves. And we would just walk all over. It was like a tradition. We'd walk all over Washington. It was always a gorgeous, crisp fall day. And we would end up at some tavern somewhere and have Thanksgiving dinner. And it was, I just remember those as really special days. What are you thankful for this Thanksgiving? Oh, so much. I mean, people have had such a hard time, and we were very fortunate that we could keep ourselves safe. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, my life has changed dramatically because Jeffrey used to leave East Hampton on Monday and come back on Friday, and he's been there the entire time. And I always kind of wondered, what's it going to be like when he moves home? Because we've done this for 40 years, and it's been heaven. I mean, I just have my buddy around all the time, which is just wonderful. We've been really fortunate, and that we've both been able to work. We've really been incredibly lucky. What is your favorite Thanksgiving dish? It's not the turkey, although I make a pretty good turkey. I think I'm thinking probably leek and mushroom bread puddings right up there and the chipotle smashed sweet potatoes and roasted Brussels sprouts. I'd say those three things together are just say Thanksgiving to me. What are your favorites? You know, I would say my mother made this dish. Everybody laughs about it at the show (laughs) uh, because of the name. It was basically a crustless sweet potato pie, but it was called it's called sweet potato poon, and and you know it's got crushed pineapple in it and cinnamon and and uh, and it, you could serve it either as a side dish or like a dessert. Yeah. Uh, but it always had uh, uh, slightly broiled marshmallows on top, and as kids we always thought it was funny to distract my mom uh, <laughs> when she put the poon under the broiler. So that it would catch Burn. fire. <laughs> it would catch fire. You know? <laughs> we thought, That's Mom, just hilarious yeah, when we, you're a kid. When you're a kid, <laughs> and to be honest, when we became adults, we still found it <laughs> hilarious. hilarious. <laughs> the Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours the eye of the caucuses. 
Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. <laughs> Some late breaking news for hours in the Iowa caucuses. By the way, I'm All right, it just made it For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Here's what you'll need for my Parmesan smashed potatoes three pounds small red potatoes, unpeeled, one tablespoon plus two teaspoons kosher salt. One and a half cups of half and half, quarter of a pound of unsalted butter, that's one stick, half a cup of sour cream, half a cup of freshly grated Parmesan cheese, it's actually ground Parmesan cheese, and half a teaspoon of freshly ground black pepper. So how did you come sour up with Sour cream, I don't know, I just thought, how can we make smashed potatoes better? Mm -hmm. So it's got great texture, it's got great flavor, uh -huh. I'm going to show you how to make them. Well, let's do it. So and then if you hate them, we'll make something I, else. How's that? I've never hated anything you've made, so I'm, I'm, oh, good. I'm, Thank I'm, you. I'm, I'm fairly confident that these are going to be fantastic. So, so what are we starting? I, what I'm going to start with is three pounds of these little, um, I think they're called red bee potatoes. They're uh -huh. small potatoes. Are they kind of like the, a, a red version of like new potatoes? They're new potatoes, uh -huh. yeah. I don't know why they're called new potatoes, but professionally they're called red bee. They're small red potatoes. Right. Now, if you, could you use a different potato? You could, but the red potato has like a very thin skin, so, mm -hmm. and we're not peeling them. We're gonna uh, leave the skin on Oh, it. interesting. So, which makes it so much easier and actually more delicious. Okay, uh, so, wait a minute, I need salt. Oh, so you gotta put, put salt. A tablespoon of salt in. Okay. Okay. So I'm just going to bring that to a boil and let it cook for like 25, 35 minutes until they're, like, until they're really tender. They've been boiling. And I just, I test it with a skewer or a little sharp knife, uh -huh. something like that. Let's see if they're done. Yeah, perfectly tender all the way through. If they scream, they're done. <laughs> so can you hear a potato screaming? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> if you listen closely. <laughs> okay. Ah, no, don't do that. Okay, so I'm just going to drain them. So while you drain them, I'm going to combine one and a half cups of half and half mm -hmm. and a stick of butter, quarter wow. of a pound of butter. I mean, you know, I they're like mashed that. potatoes after all. Hold on, we're going to listen to this drain. Okay. Oh, into the colander. <laughs> don't, don't pour them down the sink. Perfect. All right. And they go right into that bowl. Okay, now you've got you've got a, a mixture. I can't do the really difficult part, right? I've got a um, uh, KitchenAid mixer. Okay. And we're gonna put a... Oh, there's a paddle a attachment. Paddle attachment on it, exactly. Just like that. And in the meantime, I'm gonna heat up one and a half cups of half and half and an entire stick of butter. Because you can. Because you can. Now, when you're and heat, you know, when you, say you know heat, what Julia Child said. What did she say? She said, when people say to me, I don't want to use butter, what should I use? She says, well, just use cream. <laughs> <laughs> that is fat. <laughs> it's, so I'm going to turn this on. Do we know how to do this? Yeah, and then okay. you turn it. Just until it gets hot. Because okay. you don't want to put cold cream and butter into the potatoes, okay. into the warm potatoes, because it'll congeal the whole thing. Oh. So, so this is what I do. I'm just going to put the paddle attachment down. Mm -hmm and just very slowly just mix them up, so just so they break up a lot. So that's why they're called smashed. Ah. So you don't even have to puree them. So they have lots of texture, the skins are in it, and then as soon as it's kind of mashed up like that, on a very low speed, mm -hmm. and this is hot, we're gonna pour that into this. So they look better already, it, don't they? It than really regular looks, mashed yes. It's, it's got some texture. It's got texture to it. I don't yes. want mashed potatoes. I mean, sometimes you want something that's really silky and pureed, mm -hmm. but sometimes you want something for texture. Sure. And since this is Thanksgiving, we're looking for texture, yes. right? Boom. Boom. Okay. So now, let's see if we can get this all over ourselves. Okay, great. At the same time. <laughs> and then I'm going to pour three quarters of it in. Okay. Just really slowly into the potatoes. And then I'm going to fold more in if, it, if I need it. Now, what's the difference between pouring and folding? Um, I'm, folding is I'm going to take it off the mixer and then uh, fold it in with a with a 
you know, like a, um, a spatula. A spatula. Okay. Yeah. So okay, so that's that. That's it. That's it. Yeah. And then I'm going to show you. I'm going to fold the rest of the ingredients in. Let's see if I have a little spatula. I'm just going to take all the potatoes. You want to get all of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to take this off the mixing. Now, could you make this ahead of time, Ida? Actually, you can. You know what it is, is there are a couple of things you can do. You could put it in a baking dish, uh -huh. cover it with a little, um, sprinkle it with a little uh, Parmesan cheese, right. and put it in the oven and reheat it. Oh. But you know, the easiest thing is to take a bowl, mm -hmm. a heat-proof bowl, put it on a pot of boiling water, like a bain-marie, right. and just keep it warm for like half an hour. And just I just add a little more milk or cream or something mm -hmm. like that to keep it thin. Or butter. Or butter. Yeah. <laughs> Butter's always good. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, now yeah. I'm going to add two things that are going to be great flavor. Mm -hmm. Half a cup of sour cream, oh. because sour cream's always good. Could right? you substitute like a, a, a full fat yogurt or something? Sure, you I bet to? you could, yeah. And a half a cup of Parmesan cheese. Ah. And lots of salt and pepper. Two teaspoons of salt. Oh, and you want to do the pepper? And about a teaspoon of pepper, a lot of pepper. That sounds good, right? I like it. Listen to that. <laughs> that's a really nice pepper mill. Perfect. Oh, I think that's it. The final pepper. <laughs> <laughs> and then you want to get the, the rest of the milk and cream. And we're just going to add it until it's really nice and creamy. Let's see. OK. Is, can you over mix your, your, your sweet potatoes? Um, you can't over mix sweet potatoes. I mean, but, I'm sorry, that's um, what I meant. Right uh, Potatoes have starch in it, and mm -hmm. if you over mix, I would just put all of it on. I oh. think it really needs it. Yeah. Because they're they're really kind of thick. You want them really creamy. Mm -hmm. So, here we go. Do we want to taste it, make sure it's right? I, so. I mean, that was pretty easy for yeah, that really was. smashed and, potatoes. And, and no peeling, mm -hmm. and just, um, and mixed in the mixer. Yeah. Okay, let's see. So, you want to try it? Sure. Try it and see how it is. We're not even going to put it on a dish. <laughs> Gentlemen, going, start your forks. <laughs> See, now that's good. That's not so bad, right? No, and it's got a little cheesy. Just, and just also the sour cream has a little bit of um, a tang to mm -hmm. it. And the Parmesan cheese. It's pretty good. I think See, that's, that's fantastic. What, thank you. That is Have really I good. converted you? Thank you. you. Are. So I was thinking we'd put it in a saute pan to keep okay. it nice and warm. Mm. How's that? Is that a good idea? Sure. Okay. Yeah. You got the. Are you in charge of that? Uh, yes. Okay. You're in charge of that. I mean, you can put it in a big bowl, but mm -hmm. I thought it's very Thanksgiving to serve it in a pan, and then if you want to reheat it, yeah, you just put it right, right in the oven. How's the last that? Thing, the last thing to clean. You've done this before, right? Well, once or twice. <laughs> Although I'm I'm the type of person in my house it, it rarely makes it from a bowl. <laughs> <laughs> the chef has to taste it first, right? That looks fantastic. Does that look good? And maybe a little Parmesan cheese on top, mm -hmm. or I don't know if we have any left. I used it all. A little salt. I think the difference in great food and okay food is generally salt. We had a... Oh, here we go. Hold uh, on. Uh, we have a little more. We have food We have food fairies right here who bring in <laughs> this stuff. Like that, just like that. The food, food fairies. Food, food fairies, huh? Okay, go. A little Parmesan cheese on top. You know what it is? I like when people know what it is mm -hmm. by what's what's on top. Oh, okay. So if so they know it's going to be Parmesan. You give them a visual cue. Yeah. Perfect. So well done. Well, thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Parmesan gonna... smashed potatoes. Wow. Could you could you put that like say under the broiler and just kind of? Yeah, you could. Get, get a, a little, little crusty top. Crusty give it a little top. more texture, and, and actually the cheese would melt a little bit, which would be good. Wow. Good idea. Oh boy. <laughs> Get out of the way, Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming to town. Well, Ina, this has been just delightful. That's been so much fun. Thank you so much for inviting me on your first podcast. Well, thank you. And, and, <laughs> and I hope you and Jeffrey have a fantastic Thanksgiving. Thank you. And you to Deborah and, and your family, too. Thanks so much. Thank you. It's been really fun. for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. This is fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts.
Welcome to the Hoda Show. I'm just over, I'm just bubbling over because it's a beautiful day in New York City. It is sun splashed. I have only run into great people. It's been that kind of day. You know how some days you're like, oh God, I walked out the door and somebody did. I didn't have that. 